Am I still there? I think I did something I shouldn't have. And you're gone. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Because right now I don't have a picture anymore. Oh God, what am I doing? There I am. Commissioner Norton, are you with us? Yes, I am. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Marcy, you didn't call me back. I just got home. Out running around again, huh? <laughs> yeah. And just for a reminder for those joining us, um, we are streaming to YouTube right now. So we are live as we wait. Mm -hmm. Welcome Commissioner Roche. Your backdrop is inverted so you might have to do the mirror image or at least she's got one Ooh, I clicked on something and background came up. Hey, Marshall. We can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, I'm clicking on background, but nothing happens. Good evening, thank you for having me. Thank you so Thank you. much for coming. We know how busy you are, so we're honored that you take the time. So, so thank you. We're just waiting for a couple of commissioners to join us and then we'll get started. Sure. Marshall, it's great to see you. It's been so long. Hi, it's Ruth Williams. How long have you been retired? Uh, about six years now. Wow. Yeah. And how long have you been on the Public Safety Commission? 30. <laughs> Con consistently? Consistently. This is probably going to be my last meeting, though. Really? Yeah. Uh, is your term up? Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, my term is up. Um, it's just time to let the younger generation come in and, you know. But I sure miss those old days. <laughs> Have you Vice kept your oh, sorry. Um I Vice Chair Burger, we're all here, 601. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the live recording. Okay. And we're we are going, live. We're going to call the meeting to order. And um I will say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Chair Laughlin is out sick this evening. Commissioner Balbone. I'm present. Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair Berger. Here. Commissioner Hallman. Here. Commissioner Norton. Here. Commissioner Roche. Here. And Commissioner Williams. Here. Here. Are there any adjournment requests? No? Okay, approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. So the uh, motion was by Commissioner 
Williams and seconded by Commissioner Norton. Yeah. Tori, it's Carrie. I apologize. I was having an audio issue. I do have an adjournment request. Okay. Um, for Gabe Donay, um, Gabe was in an adjacent city um, who unfortunately lost his life during an incident a few weeks ago. He was murdered in his home. Okay, and thank I, you. Thank you. Anybody else? Approval of the minutes? So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Williams and seconded by Commissioner Norton. And we, Vice, we should just do a quick roll call on um, both the agenda and the minutes. Okay. So we will start with Commissioner um, approval of the agenda. Commissioner Balbone. Aye. Vice Chair Berger. Aye. Commissioner Hallman. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Roche. Aye. And Commissioner Williams. Aye. And for the minutes, um, we will start with Commissioner Balbone. Aye. Vice Chair Berger. Aye. Commissioner Hallman. Aye. Commissioner Norton. Aye. Commissioner Roche. Aye. And Commissioner Williams. Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, do we have any public comments, staff? The only speaker that signed up to speak is Charlie Jasper, but I don't see him um, in the meeting. Charlie, if you're on, you have three minutes. Vice Chair oh. Berger, I don't believe Mr. Jasper is on. Okay, no more public comments? None that came in. Okay, commissioner comments and liaison reports. None? Okay, we will move on to unfinished business and I believe that we have a presentation. Co-chair. Co -chair. Yes. Sorry, I had comments and I believe Commissioner Balbone has as well. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you, sorry. My internet froze, my apologies. Okay, Com Commissioner Roche. Thank you, co-chair, or not co-chair, vice chair. Still, still, still in the co-chair world. Um, I just wanted to um, share a few, make, I just have a few comments about some meetings I've attended. I just wanna also just um, say thank you to uh, Don Schiller who held that, or led I should say, that human trafficking virtual training. Uh, March 23rd, I did have uh, a chance to attend and you know, it's always good to hear from a survivor and she provided a ton of resources and tools. So I'm just really grateful that she also uh, approached, I really appreciated that she approached her training from a trauma-informed place as well, especially since the, you know, due to the sensitivity of, of, the, um, of the training. So I wanted to just thank uh, Don Schiller for that. I also wanted to thank Jasmine uh, Duckworth for really, facilitating a really productive conversation at the Neighborhood Watch Captain's Roundtable that I was able to attend. I also know that other, um, my colleagues, other commissioners uh, were able to attend. And I just also wanna thank um, Commissioner Holman for your support and insight in really like helping me understand some of the barriers and also just other ways of navigating to reactivate um, neighborhood watch groups that have been that have been closed for some time and are not currently being led or have co-captains and um, I'm looking forward to doing more work with you in terms of reactivating that along with Jasmine there is um, I was able to attend a the first West Hollywood housing um, advocates meeting and that was on April 7th and that was actually a really great conversation. First meeting, really getting to know the mission, the purpose of this group. And if any of you are interested in knowing more about how they are, the conversation around housing within West Hollywood, I really recommend uh, jumping on. I believe I share, I believe you were on that meeting. Yeah, at that meeting. So, and I believe also Commissioner Balbone was there. So 
I'm just looking forward to uh, incorporating these conversations in our potential work plan one day uh, <laughs> in terms of homelessness and just in general housing and affordable housing and all that you know falls within livability, right? Which is things that uh, we are constantly talking about uh, within our purview. Um, I was also able to attend the Measure J, uh, Reimagine LA Advisory Committee. Um, that was a very long meeting. I'm very interested to hear what other commissioners were able to take away from that uh, meeting. A lot of resources were shared and thank you Commissioner Belbone for sharing the, um, the what is it called, the ranking report. Um, I don't know if we, I don't know if, you, if you, know, you got something clear and concise and conclusion from that meeting. I would like to create some time in this meeting today to kind of touch on that. I think it'll help us talk about a little bit about our oversight civilian uh, agenda item. And, um, you know, last but not least, I wanted to see, and I just wanna put this out to the commissioners here, our agenda item, uh, under reimagining police, uh, policing. I'm wondering if we're able to create a separate or maybe a sub item for reimagining policing. I understand that it falls within the 9C, uh, but going forward as this reimagining policing continues to be unpacked and we continue to get more information and it starts to develop, I'm just wondering what the commission, other commissioners think about maybe creating a, a sep, its own item. So when staff gives a report, we can separate it from the sheriff's report. Uh, that is all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, staff, I'm not sure exactly if we do want to put that as a motion, uh, as an, a, a reoccurring agenda item. Um, Actually, um, Tori, it's just with consensus from the group, we can easily separate that out just like we did for cookies um, to call attention to it. That's not a problem at all. So we could, um, you know, depending on like if we have a guest speaker like this evening, we, you know, we have Marshall here. Obviously, we would if he were an equity speaker, we could move him in front of the sheriff's report, if that makes sense. Um, but we could definitely have it as its own separate item. I think that's a great idea. Okay, can we get a consensus on that quickly? Is uh, anybody opposed or anybody have anything to say about that? Okay. No, I think it's a really good idea to separate it out as its own item because even though the conversation um, the, is, is referred to as reimagining policing and obviously that's a big chunk of it, um, we, as the um, Public Safety Commission, there are other parts of public safety that um, include um, people helping members of the public and coming in contact with them, and um, the whole picture of what, of what, whether it's firefighters or block by block or the sheriff or whomever is sort of subsumed, I would think, Within, within the idea of reimagining policing as a general topic, and it shouldn't really be isolated to it as if it's only um, relevant to the sheriff. Okay, so anybody else have anything they wanna say about that? So Commissioner Tori, um, one of the things that I'd like to make sure that we include under there is um, monitoring of Measure J and the progress on you know, ATI. Um, because there will be county funds available, large amounts of county funds available that I think we need to understand how they complement some of the services that we offer. And more importantly, as some of the money moves around, because one of the things that I did pick up from that meeting on the 8th is that some of the county programs are at the back of the bus in terms of funding if they go by the community ranking, which means there could be some county programs that could be in jeopardy. And I don't know to the extent that we use any of those, but if we are using any of those, it would be good to understand. And then it would also be good to understand some of the newer programs that might get funding through community-based organizations that either we are already aligned with or could be aligned with. 
Very good suggestion. Um, staff, can you include those suggestions in the item and could you put the item after the sheriff's report in the agenda and before the um, civilian oversight item? Because I think that that will fall very well in line because sometimes we might want to contact or uh, discuss with the civilian oversight our discussion about those items too. So. So for the May meeting, um, we will put in a, a single uh, or a separate item on reimagining policing, including monitoring Measure J and other things that, that come up during discussion. So we'll, we'll call that out for the May agenda. Perfect. Thank you. Um, are there any more comments about that? Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, Commissioner Balbone, did you have any more? So um, I had attended the same meetings um, uh, and I thought again that um, Jasmine did a nice job of um, getting the neighborhood watch captains back together. Um, I also enjoyed the human trafficking seminar. I thought it was incredibly well done. I would like to make sure that that information gets shared to our neighborhood watch teams, just the materials might be helpful to them. Um, I don't know if that's happened, but I think when we have presentations in the realm of public safety and um, topics that are pertinent, it would be good to get those out to people who are volunteering their time. Um, so that's just one thing that I'd like to make sure happens. And then um, I made a few comments about Measure J and what I think is happening there. In addition to what's happening with Measure J, there's some significant changes happening with Medi-Cal that will also benefit um, homeless um, individuals and people who are um, eligible for the Medi-Cal program who have comorbidities. Um, and that's gonna be happening on 1-1. So I think there may be some opportunities and that's called Cal-AIM. When we think about some of what we've talked about as reimagining police, I also think there's a community service support system that it's gonna take a little while, but there's lots of money and lots of uh, focus on it, both from the Measure J and Cal AIM in terms of mental health and community-based support. So we may want to consider kind of how we get Cal AIM in the mix on that. It's one thing that I was thinking about as we talked through, as I listened to um, the Measure J meeting is, there are a lot of community-based organizations that are gonna be getting different levels of funding and more funding um, that could really help with some of the um, needs that we have to really think about um, our unhoused population and especially those suffering from behavioral health and substance use issues. Very good, excellent. Um, I attended the human trafficking presentation as well and I thought it was outstanding. I contacted Dawn Schiller after about any of those materials and her presentation and I think she couldn't give us the presentation but she's very willing to, um, she's very passionate about this subject. And um, I don't remember the kind of materials. Um, staff, I have her email and I'm sure um, Commissioner Roche does because she brought this up. And- um, um, Vice Chair Berger, we have mm -hmm. um, our city clerk, Melissa Crowder on with us and she's offered to make sure that um, the materials from the webinar get to Jasmine to be disseminated to the neighborhood watch captains. Excellent. And, um, and to us also, to the commissioners, if you could. And um, I liked your um, other suggestions, Commissioner Balbone, about the funding different avenues. If any of you and Commissioner Balbone have any suggestions like that, can you get them to staff ahead of time and um, staff can get them to us and then make sure that they are made available for the public before our next meeting as well. Okay, so um, let's move on to, unless anybody else has any more comments, we'll move on to um, item 9A, Los Angeles County Commission on Human Relations, 2019 Hate Crimes, with Marshall Wong to give us a presentation. Thank you very much for having me. Um, our agency, the Human Relations Commission, has been collecting and analyzing data on hate crimes since 1980 
making our annual report one of the longest standing efforts on the part of any governmental agency uh, to, uh, in, in the country. And um, uh, our report, our complete report is available at our website, which will be on the last slide of this PowerPoint presentation. Uh, what I'm gonna be doing this evening is giving you the highlights from 2019 countywide, and then some specific information about hate crimes that were reported in West Hollywood. Um, you uh, feel free to, if you wanna jump in with a, a question or, or um, at any point, or you could hold them till the end. Um, do you have a preference, Kristen? I, I, I would suggest that we would wait until the end. Okay, that's fine. All right. So um, first slide, please. So you can see by this bar chart that we documented 524 hate crimes that were reported in LA County in 2019, which was only one more than the previous year. But you can see it's part of an upward trend. Hate crimes hit an all had hit a 23 year low in 2013, and since then have been creeping upwards, which is the wrong direction. And they've risen 36 percent since 2013, which is cause for concern. But you can also see from this uh, chart that the numbers reported were much much lower than those reported in the late 90s and the early part of the uh, uh, 2000s. So how is LA County faring? It all depends on how far back you pull the lens of the camera. And most importantly, as we've just previously discussed, these cases actually only represent a fraction of the actual hate crimes. A recent Department of Justice report said that only half of hate crimes are ever reported to law enforcement. And that according to whatever they're, they're publishing in terms of federal numbers, uh, and statistics, the actual number in any given year is going to be 22 to 24 times that of the official government statistics. Next slide, please. This will show you how hate crimes broke down according to motivation. And in any given year, hate crimes motivated by race are the largest category comprising in 2019 about half of all. African Americans were again the largest group of victims, even though African Americans comprise only about eight or nine percent of the of LA County residents, they made up 47 percent of racial hate crime victims. One of the primary reasons historically for the overrepresentation of African Americans as victims of hate crime uh, are street gangs affiliated with the Mexican mafia, the largest and most violent of the prison based gangs. Mexican Mafia has been warring with Black inmates for decades, and they've given a green light to their street affiliates to attack African Americans and drive them out of their neighborhoods. Um, the second largest group uh, of racial hate crime victims uh, were Latinos. After rising for four years in a row, anti-Latino crimes declined 22%, and they made up about one quarter of all racial hate crimes. This is a surprisingly low number given that Latinos comprise about half of the county population. But one of the things that we've noted under the last few, uh, few years is that uh, re crime reporting in general within the Latino community has been falling. Okay? And many people think that that's because uh, not that the number of crimes is falling, but the level of anxiety and intimidation about being uh, having undocumented members of families detected has really um, put a chilling effect and uh, has suppressed uh, the number of Latinos reporting crimes across the board. Um, I will have to add that Latinos were the most likely of any racial or ethnic group to be victims of violent racially motivated crimes, 88%, okay? And suspects used anti-immigrant slurs in almost half of those cases. Religious crimes uh, were the second largest category. Um, they grew 11% and comprised 19% of all hate crimes. The overwhelming majority of these, almost 90% were anti-Jewish in nature. Sexual orientation crimes were the third largest category, also comprising 19%. And in these crimes, gay men were targeted in 84%. Uh, 
79% of these crimes were of a violent nature, a higher rate than those motivated by race or religion. And anti-transgender crimes rose 64% from 25 to 41, the largest number ever reported. We've seen in three of the last four years, um, record-breaking numbers of anti-transgender crimes reported. But the question that we have is, is that due to an actual increase in the number of crimes committed, or is it more related to transgender empowerment and there being less fear and intimidation of coming forward and interacting with law enforcement and uh, basically feeling that, uh, you know, they, they have an obligation to come forward to help um, uh, and, and make sure that their, that, that their crimes are reported as hate crimes. So uh, we are going to be watching this uh, particular phenomenon very, very closely. Next slide, please. As in the past, the great majority of hate crimes, 73% targeted four groups. Um, those mentioned before, African-Americans, gay men and lesbians, Jews, and Latinos. Um, however, of all those large groups, uh, uh, the largest groups of victims, only anti-Jewish crimes grew. Of the smaller groups of victims, a few experienced increases in hate crime. As I mentioned before, a record number of anti-transgender crimes. Anti-Asian crimes grew 32% from 19 to 25. And now mind you, that was 2019. We're just beginning to look at 2020 and the, uh, the upswing in anti-Asian hatred. And then anti-Middle Eastern crimes grew uh, from seven to 17, which was a 143% climb. Next slide, please. The most common criminal offense reported in 2019 was vandalism, followed by simple assaults, aggravated assaults, and acts of intimidation. Those four offenses constituted 92% of all hate crimes. There were no murders reported, fortunately, in 2019, but there was one attempted murder. In Lancaster, a Latino male was arguing with another man on a bus. A black male victim asked the suspect to stop the suspect called the victim racial slurs, pinned him to the front windshield of the bu bus, pulled out a knife and stabbed him multiple times. The suspect was arrested by sheriff's deputies. The victim was transported to a hospital with deep lacerations in his head, neck, and face. Next slide, please. I wanted to point out a few more findings from our report. Violent hate crimes grew from 61 to 65% the highest rate reported since 2008. Now, 93% uh, of gender motivated crimes were of a violent nature, and that's consistently the highest, followed by sexual orientation, 79, race, 75, and religion, 32. Next slide. Interestingly, also, after declining for two years, we've been tracking um, hate crime in which there's evidence of white supremacist ideology since 2004. Usually these are crimes in which swastikas and other hate symbols are used in graffiti. Occasionally a suspect will yell out the name of a white supremacist group or self-identify as a skinhead um, during the course of the offense. Um, after declining two years in a row, white supremacist crimes jumped 38%. Interestingly, although in recent years, some of the new groups like the Proud Boys and Rise Above Movement have gained national visibility, neither of these groups have been implicated in any local crimes. Some of their members have been arrested and charged with crimes that occurred in other jurisdictions when they traveled out of Southern California to be able to uh, uh, attend um, white supremacist rallies and attack counter protesters. Next slide. And finally, hate crimes committed by declined 37%, and anti-African American crimes committed by gang members plummeted 72%. So that's uh, we're really hoping that that's pointing in the right direction. Next slide, please. And then this map will give you an idea of the geographic um, uh, 
spread and distribution. Um, the largest number of hate crimes took place in what we call the Metropolitan Service Planning Area, um, uh, which stretches from West Hollywood, eastward through Hollywood, Mid, Mid Wilshire, downtown, through um, Boyle Heights, okay? followed by the San Fernando Valley. Um, if you compare the number of people living there uh, and the number of crimes, it is that Metro Spa, which includes West Hollywood, which had the highest rate, followed by what they call the West serving, Service Planning Area, uh, which includes Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, Malibu, West LA, um, and some other affluent beach communities. And it's been interesting because normally people don't think of those affluent beach communities or West LA as being a hotbed of hate crimes. Um, but this is the, the fifth year in a row, I believe, that they've had the second highest rate. Um, the lowest uh, numbers and rates were found in the San Gabriel Valley and the eastern region of the county that includes cities like Downey and Norwalk. Uh, why does that part of the county consistently have low numbers? Well, remember how earlier I said that the great majority of hate crimes target four groups. There are very, very few African Americans living in that part of the county, very few Jewish institutions or synagogues. Um, and very, very few LGBT oriented businesses, which tend to be the magnet for where a lot of homophobic hate crimes take place. So it's just kind of the demographic mix in that part of the county. Now we'll move on to West Hollywood numbers. And we've got some good news. Next slide, please. You'll see uh, the, uh, the number of hate crimes reported in 2018 and 19 for West Hollywood and some of the immediate surrounding cities. Now you can see that in 2018, West Hollywood had by far the largest number of hate crimes reported and they decreased significantly to, uh, to only 11 in 2019. Um, so, uh, you know, that's uh, some very, very positive news and we hope that that's a sign of things to come. Next slide. Um, if we look at crimes by, by motivation, uh, because we have relatively few, only 11, uh, the largest number were religious oriented or unknown. And what we, what we classified as unknown motivation, if say, for example, a swastika is um, painted on the uh, property of someone who identifies as white, Christian, and heterosexual, and has no idea why they might be singled out for a white supremacist symbol, could it have been, could the perpetrator have hit the wrong car or the wrong house? Or could it have been uh, that they didn't like uh, the uh, children's friends who they would see coming over? We just don't know. And so we leave that as unknown. And then uh, you see that there were two sexual orientation crimes, two racially motivated ones, and one uh, anti-transgender crime. Next slide. Um, the biggest thing you'll see here as far as uh, the dram a dramatic drop is that um, hate crimes targeting gay males in West Hollywood dropped from 11 to only one in 2019, which is uh, great news and very, very dramatic. Next slide. And the other good news for West Hollywood is that very few of the crimes were of a violent nature. Of the 11 um, that were reported, um, oh, I'm sorry, there seems to be a mistake here. These do, <laughs> these do not add up to 11. I think, um, I think some of the information that was transferred here um, didn't get put on this, but uh, I can I can rerun those, send them to Kristen. Um, but uh, basically, most of the crimes reported in West Hollywood were of a non-violent uh, nature. Okay. Um, next slide, please. And in terms of location, the largest number took place in public uh, in public places like sidewalks, parks, streets, uh, and you can see that those fell 
by um, two thirds in uh, 2019. Um, next slide. The number of crimes in which there was any evidence of white supremacist ideology rose slightly from five to seven. Next slide. You'll be glad to know that there were no hate crimes uh, in which the suspects were identified as gang members. And finally, next slide. There were no crimes in which any anti-immigrant slurs were used during the commission of the offense. All good news, okay? What we're gonna do is end now with just a sample of three of the crimes that were reported in West Hollywood that year. Uh, I don't need to read them to you. I apologize in advance for the strong language, but we like to include some of these examples because sometimes when you throw uh, together a lot of statistics, the human cost and impact of hate crimes gets obscured. So we'll begin with the first example. Next slide. Next slide, please. And the final slide. Here's our web uh, our website. This is how you can contact me if you have any questions or would like some additional information. We are available to um, make presentations uh, of this nature to a variety of audiences if people want to know specifically about a, a geographic region within the um, county or if they want to know about certain phenomena like hate crimes that occur in public schools. Uh, we can pull that data and provide very specialized briefings. Okay. So let me open it up and see if anyone has any questions or comments. Commissioner Williams. Yes. Um, hi, Marshall. Um, where do you get your statistics from? Do they come directly from our sheriff's department or from the county? Um, what we do is we get the sheriff's uh, records department to provide them for all of the jurisdictions that they serve. So we don't get them directly from the substation in West Hollywood. And in addition to all of the law enforcement agencies in LA County, and there are more than 40 of them, we also collect uh, data every year from school districts, coll colleges and universities, and uh, a relatively small number of uh, civil rights organizations that take reports of hate crimes directly from victims. I'm wondering if um, there's a way, and Bill Mulder might be able to answer this, if uh, somehow our sheriff's department can give you directly what, is, what comes from West Hollywood, because I'm not questioning the, the number, it just seems very low from what we've seen on our reports that we get monthly from the sheriff's department. You, you receive a, a monthly report of crime in general or hate, hate crimes specifically? All crimes in All general, crimes. including vandalism and so forth. So, um, and I don't know if Bill is on or not, or if he could answer that. Hi, Ruth. This is uh, Bill Mulder from West Hollywood Sheriff Station. And yeah, uh, the, the, um, the, um, uh, information that Marshall is getting is from the department and we report, you know, the same information in terms of hate crimes or hate incidents uh, into, into the system and then they're pulled out of the system and given to him. So it would be the same exact information. Thank you. And if there's, if you see something that looks different or a question about, let me know and I'll do some research on it just to ensure it. But it, it is the same information what we're reporting from you in terms of from what source we're, we uh, capture from the same, same source that's uh, giving it um, uh, uh, to Marshall. So Lieutenant Mulder, would that show up as a hate crime on the report that we get? 
Yeah, so um, so it's a little bit more complicated than that because uh, we have hate incidents and then we have hate crimes. And so uh, for us, for our reporting, how we initially report, if there is a certain language uttered that's a hate, hate type speech, hate language, and not associated with any other crime, somebody just said those words or drew a, a swastika on the building, we take that as a, uh, although that would be also a uh, vandalism too, because they're, if they're destroying property by drawing something on it, um, then uh, we either take it as a hate incident if there's no crime attached. And if there is a crime attached, like somebody hit somebody and then uh, made some utterance uh, that is uh, uh, hate, that is a hate speech, then we take that report it's filed as a, a battery, depending on the type of uh, assault, and then um, with the hate incident, and then the district attorney makes a determination whether they're going to prosecute it as like a hate crime. So um, the way we initially take the information might not end up um, 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 what the district attorney uh, files, and in the same way we might file try to file a hate crime, but they they might not want to file a hate crime. So. So I think that's where maybe sometimes it can change. But in terms of like reporting and statistically hate related incidents, whether there be a hate incident or a hate crime, um, um, Marshall should have the same information that we have. So um, when that is reported to us, is there any kind of, I, I haven't noticed it. Is there a, an indication that it's a hate incident or anything like that on our reports that we get for our commission? So I think it, I don't think they, for those reports, they uh, bifurcate it, um, uh, hate incident, whether it's hate crime or hate incidents or all reported, I think is the same statistically because uh, they're all technically hate incidents. And then there's a determination whether if there was some other behavior like a vandalism and assault, um, uh, then if it's going to be charged as a hate crime. And then part of that, that the, the, the crime had to be fueled by the, the hate. Because uh, sometimes two people get in a fight and then words are uttered during that fight. And then maybe they're not filed as a hate incident because the reason for the fight or reason for the assault wasn't really based on, wasn't the DA feels based on hate, but those words were used during that fight. If that makes sense, rather not to get into, into the weeds. But those statistics in terms of hate incidents cover everything um, should should be the same what we what we gather here and what Marshall is using and what that we're giving you but they might not be broken down that way okay um, anybody else have any more thank you Commissioner Williams anybody else have any more questions on this I I do have a comment on it I um, the second incident that was reported uh, where the guy got hit in the bus, they contacted me, his friend contacted me just about immediately after it happened. And then I followed up with the guy for months uh, about this. And it was the district, it was a really bad deal. The guy was just sitting there and the, and the, uh, the other guy in the bus surprised him and hit him with something in his hand, broke his jaw, broke his face, his cheekbones. It was a, it was a really bad mess. And, um, and the district attorney didn't file it as a hate crime for some reason. And he was confused about that. He, he says, I just going to go. They didn't think they could make it stick for some reason or they wanted to get him on something else. But um, West Hollywood uh, really helped this guy um, with different kinds of uh, funding and everything. Just so you all know that. Um, they were really, they were really on it. And so we should be proud of that. But like uh, Marshall Wong said, most of these, uh, probably half don't even get reported as a hate crime. And they're scared. He was scared. So I just, I know that we all want to um, stay on top of this because a lot of them don't even get reported. Um, and, and like you said, they didn't, they didn't prosecute it as a hate, it took months before it went through. So 
I, I'm just thinking about a way that we can be a little bit more alerted when something like this happens. Maybe Lieutenant Mulder, if you see some things that you might want to put a little asterisk at the bottom of the report sometime, that this might be something we, even though it hasn't been gone through the uh, district attorney yet, that it might indicate to us uh, something that comes to your attention um, uh, that we could address it early on that way. Um, what do you think about something like that? Uh, yes, Commissioner Berg, you know, uh, absolutely. If we have an, uh, an issue or we have an incident that uh, that's hate related and uh, we'll certainly um, 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 bring it before the commission and uh, they'll give you guys the information about it and uh, um, um, so forth. Yeah, we can absolutely do that. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, let's move on to um, the report from fire department. Can I just say one thing? Oh, Commissioner Williams. Yeah, uh, Marshall, I just wanted to thank you for coming and sharing this with us. And on a personal note, it was so nice to see you again. And if I can ever be of any help, you know where I am. But thank you again, your appearance tonight was appreciated. And Marshall, thank you so much for coming. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Marshall. Chief thank you. Gor Chief Gorbani. Yes, good evening, everyone. I'm looking at the uh, report activity for West Hollywood for the last month, and I don't see anything unusual. If there's any specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Um, we're tracking along as we normally do. Uh, medical runs and um, uh, related incidents all seem to be within our normal range and nothing remarkable really from the fire side. Are there any questions that I can answer directly? I do have one. Um, I've noticed that the psychological calls seem to be increasing. I don't know if there's anything to that, but I just was curious about what you're seeing in terms of trends there because they seem to be they were high last month, they're high again this month. Um, I don't know if they'll continue to get higher and higher, but it just would be interesting to understand a little bit of what you're seeing there. Sure, um, the term psychological type run for us is a pretty broad scope and range. Um, that's the way that dispatch is able to take the call and understand the type of call as opposed to a chest pain or a shortness of breath or a trauma type issue. So for psychological, it's a very broad range of things. And unless I had specifically what the final chief complaint or patient disposition was, I really wouldn't be able to elaborate. Um, I can start to ask around if you like and see if I can dig through those numbers a little bit. Um, but as it sits, pretty broad definition. I think it would be helpful to understand, is it, is it anything to do with, um, you know, loneliness, COVID, isolation, or is it something that we're seeing with substance use or something else that gets kind of swathed into that category. It'd just be good to understand if there's anything that's causing the spike or if it's just a little bit of everything. I understand, yeah. Normal mode uh, prior to COVID, if we were talking about a psychological run, I would tell you it's a little bit of everything, um, but I understand your question and I can sure um, look into the numbers a little bit and report back to you. Thank you. Of course. Anybody else with questions? Chief Gorbani, if you could um, pass that information to staff, Kristen Cook, to us before the next meeting and, and she'll get it to the commissioners and then, um, and then we can report on it at the next meeting as well, if you could do that um, for the public's sake. So- Of course, I'd be happy okay. to do that. Okay, thank you. Of course. And Vice Chair Berger, I just want to note that we also have Assistant Chief Drew Smith with us on tonight. Um, so thank you both chiefs for being here this evening. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for the support. Just have one thing. So we have had a change of command. So just uh, um, just give you an overview. We have a new deputy chief, which is Thomas Ewald. He'll be taking Chief Maroney's spot. We also have a new battalion chief in West Hollywood, and that's a sign of the B ship with Josh Binder. He's a 22 year veteran and uh, he's worked in West Hollywood uh, before, and he's going to be a great, great asset to the team to support West Hollywood and the fire department. And your fire family is doing well. 
Thank you for your service. Thank you. Commissioner Norton, do you have a question? Um, okay, Chief Gorbani, thank you for um, that. Uh, did, oh, somebody have a question? No. Uh, thank you for that. And I, I really appreciate uh, the way that you presented it with just saying there wasn't anything unusual. In fact, city council that was suggested that we don't spend a lot of time on just reading through all of the numbers. Rather, um, we all get those numbers and we can ask those questions. And um, if you noticed anything, just bring it up and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll target some of the things with our commissioners. It saves us time to spend on other things. Okay, um, Commissioner Norton, did you have a question? Okay, we're gonna move on to the Sheriff's Report. Uh, good evening, everybody. This is Bill Mulder from West Hollywood Sheriff Station. I'll be doing the Sheriff's Report. Uh, for March uh, 2021, part one crime was up 24% with 112 incidents when compared to uh, March 2020 that had a 90 incidents. And just for context, um, March and April of 2020 recorded the lowest number of part one crimes in the city's history. Uh, so last, uh, last month, actually February, 2021, we had hundred and 103 part one crimes. And, you know, it sounds concerning, but we, you know, with, with, this is kind of what we were expecting, obviously with the, the lowest um, part one crime reporting in the history, uh, we assumed that, you know, this year it would probably be up and it is. Um, but the year to date, part one crimes are still down uh, 10% when you compare last year's year to date uh, number uh, from the same time. Um, the uh, other burglary category, which is the like sub garages, apartment buildings, uh, mail rooms, um, and so forth, uh, are also been high and they've really dri been driving the percentages when we went we went from eight incidents in March of 2020 in terms of the other burglary category to 21 incidents in March of 2021. Um, the crime has broken down by area. So um, for last month, 42% of the part one crimes occurred on the west side, 29% uh, city center, and then 29% on the east side. Uh, so with our special teams, we continue to do saturation patrols. We also do, uh, continue to do uh, plain clothes, special operations, uh, targeting uh, the burglary issue, uh, as well as uh, we've done um, robbery plain clothes operations as well. We've been in con contact with a lot of the residential buildings and businesses about uh, making sure there's cameras, lighting, uh, gates and fencing. We've gone out to locations to uh, um, talk to them about their security measures to help improve uh, security measures. And we also um, participate, of course, on the Chamber of Commerce uh, calls with businesses and the Business Improvement District calls as well. Uh, Detective Bureau has also been taking, obviously, a really active role in trying to um, identify and arrest and prosecute the individuals that have been committing these burglaries, uh, especially the uh, mail thefts. Uh, we've been sending out flyers to various uh, sister uh, sister agencies uh, to see if we can get identification of these individuals and link them to uh, additional additional crimes. Um, on uh, <clears throat> Wednesday, and I think I, I covered this in the last meeting, but since it did happen in March, I think it, it happened the beginning of March. Uh, just to recap on the robbery we had on Norton, uh, where. Um, multiple items were stolen. Uh, and then we continue to uh, work with uh, Beverly Hills PD, LA PD um, on these investigations of the robberies that, that had occurred around that period of time. And uh, all our patrol deputies and our special teams are aware of that. And as I said earlier, our special teams have actually done several operations, robbery operations, both um, uniformed and uh, plain clothes operations. Um, and we uh, also continue to monitor the situation created by the marijuana dispensary cookies, which is located in the city of Los Angeles on Melrose Avenue and Kings Road. Uh, the Los Angeles C City Cannabis Regulation Commission has not met since our last uh, public safety commission. Um, and uh, as you may have heard, there was a very concerning incident that occurred on March 31st related to cookies. 
uh, several males who re refused entrance into Cookies flashed a gun at security uh, uh, at Cookies. And it appears those same individuals drove to the intersection of Kings and Clinton, which is one block south of Cookies, and fired several rounds from a gun. Um, our West Hollywood detectives are, in, in, of course, investigating that incident, and we're working with LAPD as well. And again, this is a horrific incident that occurred in our city, endangering everyone here. Uh, fortunately, obviously, nobody was hurt, and uh, but we're very concerned that, you know, if Cookies remains at that location, that somebody's going to be seriously hurt or worse. And the City Council of West Hollywood City staff and the Sheriff's Department has continued to, you know, advocate uh, for Cookies to be closed in order to basically for our community there and, and um, our whole entire West Hollywood community to resume a nor normal and safe life. Um, we continue to conduct our weekly care outreach operations for people experiencing homelessness with our special teams. Um, you might have noticed in the aggravated assault category, about actually about half of the half of those or more than half were committed by transient individuals. And a lot of those were related to if they are at a business or if they were maybe trying to commit a theft and asked to leave by the business people or security, then a uh, then a, a, an assault uh, occurred. We, we also continue our partnership with Tarzana Treatment Center and expanding it to all um, arrestees. Uh, with the uh, opening of the restaurants, again, our entertainment policing team has returned to their normal hours and um, we have additional um, people on our footbeat on the west side as well as with code compliance, um, handling issues at bars, clubs, restu or restaurants, and, um, uh, and now opening with bars and uh, and then party, uh, house party issues. And then with the upcoming Robertson closure, then we'll have um, additional um, staffing uh, from the Sheriff's Department to address security uh, concerns there. And again, thank you to our Public Safety Director, Kristen Cook, who's again, always allowing us the flexibility uh, to move people around to uh, address these different, different things that are going on with our city to make things safer. Um, this month or past month, we put out in our uh, social media information about uh, street robberies, sexual assault prevention and nightclub safety, distracted driving, bicycle safety, cyberbullying, leaving pets unattended in a vehicle, uh, fire safety, uh, texting 911, ID theft, and some, um, some other things. Uh, as you know, too, the Sheriff's Department has agreed to participate in a study by the uh, Center for Policing Equity. Our county council from Los Angeles County has reviewed the MOU between us and the Center for Policing Equity, made some minor, um, uh, uh, minor changes, um, and has sent it, now it's back with the Center for Policing Equity for them to review. Um, um, and then once it comes back to us, it will go to our executive uh, staff and sheriff uh, to uh, be signed. And uh, one last uh, but real important uh, thing that happened, as you know, there was a, a sexual assault on uh, January 21st uh, of this year on Fountain Avenue. Um, our, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Special Victims Detectives have been investigating that case. And um, uh, last month, they uh, identified the um, identified a suspect, uh, a Brian or Brian uh, Guerrero, who's 34 years old, uh, he was, uh, and they filed charges on him with the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. He was already in uh, custody um, with uh, an arrest from the Los Angeles Police Department for another uh, unrelated uh, sexual assault case. So that can, you know, then additionally, uh, just uh, to go over the questions that were asked at our last meeting and the answers that were uh, provided, um, Commissioner Berger had asked uh, regarding the MET presentation about outcomes of 40 or so cases that were reported but not handled by MET. They were handled by regular patrol because probably MET was unavailable. And because of HIPAA protections, we weren't able to access uh, the exact outcomes uh, regarding those cases where, you know, somebody was committed to a hold and then what happened with uh, their particular case. Uh, Commissioner Hallman asked about um, if gun crimes have increased, and I had, had answered the question at the meeting, went over some statistics um, about those. So armed robberies, and most of them uh, were with firearms. In 2019, we had 29, 2020, we had 26, 
and 2021, we had five uh, thus far. Um, assault with a deadly weapon, firearm for the entire city uh, for 2019, there were nine. For 2020, there were nine. And thus far, 2021, uh, we're at uh, uh, three. Uh, Commissioner uh, Holman also asked about uh, field, uh, fielding bike deputies, and uh, we are going to um, do that probably in the summer, summer, warmer summer months, and we will ramp up things to make sure that all our equipment is in place to do that. So that will conclude my report if you have any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Williams. Yeah. Um, hi, Bill. I was wondering if you've had any luck trying to track down who uh, these mailbox thieves and package thieves, because as you know, we, we were, our mailboxes were broken into for the third time and um, it's getting very frustrating. Yeah, it's and very also, frustrating. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I, I hate to beat a dead horse, so to speak, but with things opening up, I'm seeing more and more people who are not wearing masks. And it's really very frightening to think that suddenly the world is open and we don't have to have protection anymore. So I'm, I'm wondering how it's going with, uh, if you're still doing any citations for people that aren't wearing masks. But more important, of course, is the mail issue and the package that so, so regarding the uh, mail theft issue, yeah, it's been huge, unfortunately. And um, we, um, I said, like I said in my the presentation, we the, our detectives are working on it. Where uh, a lot of the, uh, um, um, especially the apartment houses that have where the mail rooms are being uh, burglarized, they have uh, video. Uh, but um, Unfortunately, a lot of the people that are coming in uh, that we're capturing on video are also going to be hard to identify because they are wearing masks, obviously a mask for uh, COVID and uh, usually some head, some hat or something like that. So it, be, it becomes sometimes complicated, obviously, to uh, identify those individuals. So what we've been doing is a lot of these places do uh, have video. From those videos, we've been, um, our crime analysis has been putting, putting out flyers or other policing agencies and sending them out to see if we can identify, if we can identify people if they've had arrests and um, that we can link these people uh, to. So they've been actively working on that. We're also um, connecting with uh, the, the postmaster and looking at maybe the possibility of changing uh, the, the, uh, these pass keys because some years ago, um, I, this was spoken about I, at the last um, city council meeting, but some years ago we had a, a, a rise in this. And I think one of the considerations was to change that, that pass key. We're seeing that a, a lot of these people that are committing these mail thefts now have a pass key. So it might be something that needs to be done now, or maybe looking at some sort of different electronic process um, other, than, other than like a actual hard key uh, that people can start using to protect mailboxes and prevent this, um, this from happening. Bill, I have been on the phone so many times with the Cherokee Station, and since the very first uh, break-in that we had, they keep promising they're going to send somebody out to change the, those um, locks, and to this date, they still haven't. I was talking to our mail carrier the other day, and he said he just doesn't understand what's going on over there, but he'll put in another request. But as you know, this is the third time and still have not come out to change those locks. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that reasoning. I think, I, I don't know if it's still COVID in a COVID issue or in terms of their personnel, the people that are at work or that are not at work. Um, and the, um, uh, certainly this is happening a lot. So they might have quite a few of these orders online to address, but um, hopefully they'll get out there sooner rather than later. Thank you. Commissioner Holman. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Berger. Uh, Chair Bald, I have two questions. Uh, my first is um, most likely before our next meeting, the Derek Chauvin trial will conclude. Uh, so my question is, in the event that he is found not guilty, uh, 
does the city, the sheriff's department have a contingency plan in the event that we might see protests? Um, obviously we saw a great deal of protests uh, when George Floyd was murdered globally. So I just wanna know, are we preparing for the outcome? So, Commissioner Hallman, yes, we uh, are. Um, so, we had uh, the Sheriff's Department, West Hollywood Station, I had a meeting last week with our law enforcement partners on the west side. Um, it was hosted at uh, Beverly Hills Police Department and online uh, for those uh, to try to um, prevent a lot of people gathering there because of COVID. So, we, uh, a lot of people appeared, uh, attended the meeting online. So, Beverly Hills Police Department, Culver City, Santa Monica Police Department, um, LAPD, uh, Hollywood, Wilshire, and West LA uh, were there, uh, and CHP was also there. And we uh, discussed this very topic, um, talking about uh, what had happened uh, prior last year during the protests, and then some of the incidents that turned into uh, riot, rioting or looting, vandalizing, and um, then discussed kind of what we, uh, what everybody was planning to do uh, to address. Um, if any issues come up, like, like you've described. So the Sheriff's Department, we're going to be probably going on a tactical schedule um, at some point as the trial nears uh, conclusion. Um, that tactical scheduling means that all the entire Sheriff's Department will be on 12 and 12. So half the Sheriff's Department will be working a 12-hour shift from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. during the day. Then the other half of the department will be working 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, to make sure we have uh, the numbers available uh, at any time. Um, then uh, we are also, uh, be, we'll be um, putting assets around the county. Um, and uh, this is, this at our station is one area where we'll probably have assets here ready to deploy things like a mobile field force or a sheriff's response team and, uh, and at different places around the county. Uh, then we as a station, have met and discussed this and discussed what our tactical plan is going to be. We'll have a, um, um, we're putting together our operations plan for this and in determining what kind of um, uh, uh, um, personnel assets we're gonna need. And then what are, the things, what are the things we're going to do to ensure the safety of everybody. So yeah, we, we have a plan uh, that we're discussing and it's uh, already actually in motion. Great, um, thank you, Senator Mulder. Then my second question, um, on the edge of West Hollywood on Formosa down by Romaine, um, as well as on Poinsettia uh, by the park, uh, we're seeing a few tents pop up again. And I think we all remember the incident that we had a few years ago with the encampment um, around the park on Poinsettia. Um, is the sheriff's department keeping an eye on this and working with also LA, LAPD uh, just to kind of stay ahead of uh, what could possibly happen? Not that you know we want to just throw people out, but just keep an eye on the situation. Uh, yes, we are. Uh, we are aware of some of these um, situations where there are, um, like the one you described. Um, specifically the one I know on Formosa, which is just south of our area on Formosa, uh, in front of the lot area. Um, and we are in contact with LAPD and their senior lead officer who has responsibility for that area. And, um, um, and you know, letting them know the feedback that we're getting. We get citizen uh, and uh, civilian complaints about uh, those encampments from people in our community. And uh, we pass that on to LAPD. And uh, generally, they'll and generally they'll go out and contact the individuals and, and do what they can do. Uh, they function under a little uh, different situation than we do. Um, and then uh, uh, sometimes if we continually get complaints about it. Then we will go in and uh, talk to the individuals and see what we can help to offer them, either on one of our care outreach operations or during uh, regular uh, our regular uh, regular duty for our special teams. Thank you. Commissioner Roche. 
Thank you, Commissioner Hallman, for bringing that up. That's a really great, both, both points are really great. Um, I'm, I would like to kind of elaborate on your second point with uh, Lieutenant Mulder regarding the encampments. So, Insedia Park, does that fall, does it, so it does not fall within West Hollywood's district, correct? Uh, yes, Commissioner, you are correct. That's in the city of Los Angeles. And in some of these, um, um, uh, some of the setups that um, Commissioner Hallman was referring to are just like out of our border, just on the other side of our border in the city of Los Angeles. Would you know, and maybe this is a question for Kristen as well, if our city has a process in place where we mobilize, we have one of our mobile teams outside of the Sheriff's Department um, to offer services. It may not be part of our, you know, uh, may not, it, we may not willingly share those services because it fall, doesn't fall within our district or so within our city boundaries. So I'm curious because that's something that kind of falls on, on the border, how it's handled if it's kind of just, I hear that the Sheriff's Department communicates with LAPD, but I'm curious if there's any additional steps that are taken from our city. So, so yeah, I'll, I'll answer part of that. Oh, then, or, and then Kristen, if you want to go with the city, the city part of it. Thank you, Bill. And so for us, and kind of like I alluded to, we'll initially notify LAPD. It is in their jurisdiction. Give them the opportunity to address the issue. If the address, if the issue is not addressed, and we, and it's the problem still occurring, and we're still getting complaints from people within our community in West Hollywood, then uh, we'll go and like talk to individuals, our teams, our sheriff teams, and then like we do on our care outreach operations, see if we can, if we can offer them any services, any help, um, or uh, those types of things. And Kristen, I think you can, you can opine on what the, the city assets will do. Yeah, so service providers uh, definitely cross boundaries often uh, because you know our community members are on both sides you know they're they're in west hollywood sometimes they're in los angeles sometimes and you know our overall goal is to help the individual and connect the person with services that they need um, so the service providers definitely cross back and forth um, our specifically funded teams largely stay in west hollywood But ultimately the responsibility falls on the city of Los Angeles. Like we may want to step in, but that's really up to our discretion. It's, um, you know, the border, there's lots of shared border issues, you know, with any city side by side. So, you know, again, we take a team approach to it, but absolutely yes. You know, if there's, um, you know, a, a large group in Poinsettia Park, it's going to be driven by the city of Los Angeles to respond, not the city of West Hollywood. Uh, that's not to say that we couldn't or wouldn't help out. Thank you. I actually have a couple more questions <laughs> not pertaining to that. <laughs> I'll just quickly just get through those. Um, my One of my other questions had to do with part one crimes and uh, this is also for Lieutenant Mulder. Are there different protocols for part one crimes versus part two crimes? Uh, so when you, you're uh, asking about different protocols in what sense, like in terms of reporting, reporting protocols or um, handling protocols, Both. in what sense do you ask? Both, I mean, reporting and handling. I, 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 I'm trying to, educate myself on on your process or the department's process in handling both. More specifically, I'm very interested in how part one crimes are handled. So I, so in terms of, uh, we use part one crimes, which are like, you know, murder, robbery, sexual assault, uh, some burglary, certain thefts, um, as a way to look at how many occur we compare like we uh, uh, we compare to the previous year to see are we up or down uh, th those are the part one crimes are the mo more severe crimes and that's kind of how we guide then what we do because we want to make sure we that's a it, I mean ultimately we hope that's going to be zero uh, but obviously that's not going to happen but we want to keep that number as low as possible uh, so that's why we focus 
on um, part one crimes. We focus on, we use that as a way to kind of describe what's going on in a city in terms of crime wise. And then part two crimes are then the other, all the other uh, crimes basically that are not included uh, in the part one category. And there are of a, some of them, uh, most of them are of a, obviously a less severe nature. Although some crimes do fall into part uh, two category, which are also, um, I, you know, they're very severe, they're serious crimes. So, um, but the part one we use basically to guide um, us on what's happening in our community, uh, where we need to, uh, and what times, what days, how we need to use our assets to address those issues to bring those numbers down. Yeah, I find it interesting that, like, yeah, I'm I'm assessing the this the range of what falls under part one versus what falls under part two. So I'm just learning learning the system. Uh, my other question falls um, falls under the uh, MOU you were referring to and the current status, and that it sounds like. Right now, it's in the hands of CPE to review. Um, do you, or maybe this question's for Kristen, do either of you know uh, if we have a timeline on when we can expect to hear back from CPE? Um, so CPE has been wonderful. Let me just put that out there. They've been great. Um, but they uh, were backlogged with a bunch of other data studies that they were already committed to. And then the whole world uh, said, help, help us, you know, last summer. So we didn't get a copy of their new MOU, their side, their legal counsel updated the MOU recently. Um, I actually was impressed with how fast county council looked at it. No offense, Bill. And thank you if you uh, helped move that along because county council only had it for uh, like a couple days and made some edits. That's back with CPE. Um, CPE is now asking that the city sign the MOU as well, which obviously we support in theory, um, but that will also have to be reviewed by our city attorney's office. I don't anticipate them keeping it for more than a couple days as well. Um, sheriff's executives also need to take a look. So it just kind of depends how fast that moves, but, but because county council was so fast, that tells me that one, there's nothing in there that was really glaring or concerning. And so it kind of moved quickly. So I anticipate, you know, maybe there'll be some more tweaks, but in a couple of weeks, we should have something signed. Um, they're already looking at, and they've given Bill a bunch of information on how they need the data and what type of data and what format. So they're already working behind the scenes so that, you know, the data dump is, is quick and easy on their side before they start their analysis. So they're, you know, we're kind of doing both things at the same time, if that makes sense. So it doesn't lag even more when we're ready. Yeah, the reason why I'm asking is because I know that we are trying to wrap up. Uh, I shouldn't say we're trying to wrap up. Let me take that back. I know that we're at a place with the commission where we're waiting on final appointees right? And we're waiting on at large. And my hope is that that is all established by May meeting, by our May, me, meeting in May. So by the next meeting. So I'm curious, is there a way for us to possibly get a report, like maybe a timeline of what actions have been taken and what future actions pending items we're waiting on, just so we're all kind of up to speed to know what are what the future potential timeline is? Is this going to take an additional three more months? Um, what are we really looking at? Or could we really trust that we can start diving into it starting May? Right. Y yes, is the short answer. Um, if you look at our last six month report, um, which if you all need another copy, uh, it, it goes through all of that. Uh, but I can definitely, I'll make myself a note. I'll email kind of the summary of what the commission has done since last June going forward. Um, I apologize if you sent that. No, no, I don't know it was which in the report that went to council. So it was in the oh. packet, um, okay. the public safety update that we did. <laughs> Janet, was it just last week, which we did April 5th? April 5th, yes. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, the days are kind of <laughs> running together. 
Um, so at the April 5th council meeting, that agenda item from public safety discussed all of the activities kind of generally that the commission has taken since last summer. But I will cut and paste out of that document and send you just that piece um, to commissioners, just to make it easy, you know, so it's easy, easy to take a look at. Um, we have been waiting for appointees to be complete so we could really dig a little deeper into some of this. And we're gonna get into some of this at the Civilian Oversight Commission discussion a little bit later tonight. There's some things we don't wanna wait, you know, until the appointees are finalized, but it will be a big help um, if council goes ahead and just makes their final appointments a week from tonight. And we do anticipate that those appointments will be made a week from tonight. And so that'll put us in a much better, situation of the makeup of the commission, giving everybody up to speed and, you know, moving forward on additional projects as well. Thank you so much, Kristen. Mm -hmm. That'll be all. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Balbon. So um, I have a couple of questions, Lieutenant Mulder. Um, the first one is, it looked like there was an uptick in vehicle burglary on the west side. Were those related incidents or just happened to be a very popular location last month. Yeah, Commissioner Balbone. Yeah, the we had I think 15 incidents last month, and it's kind of going through and just looking at them. It looked like it was like almost one a day. Well, only one in a day. There might be one at two, but um, uh, it it is up from certainly the previous month. And it appears that just more opportunistic. It's um, we're not seeing like a uh, organized group come down and uh, and uh, committing these. Um, uh, but that's something that again we always uh, kind of message to people to not keep stuff in their cars and uh, especially in any kind of view. Um, uh, most of those are from I think uh, property that are in the vehicles in view. And so that's happened. It's an as an opportunistic type crime, but we're not seeing it as a uh, based on how it um, based on what we saw last month. We, we don't uh, believe it's a organized ring. Good, glad to hear it. That's exactly what I was hoping wouldn't be the case. So that's good. Um, so um, the other question that I have is, you know, um, Commissioner Holman brought up Holman brought up a good point about potential protests. Last year, when we had the protests, very opportunistic people hit very specific business targets. And as you prepare, are you talking with the chamber about any preparation for some of our businesses? Because, you know, you walked around, it was the high-end shops, the dispensaries, and the pawn shops. They were all very much targeted right out of the gate. And I'm curious to see if we're at least having conversations just in case so that those businesses are prepared. So, yeah, you know, we have a, a weekly um, um, uh, call with people from the chamber on Fridays and we can talk about those issues and they can ask questions. And that will be something of um, uh, will be a topic of conversation I'm sure for the next one. And then we also have our sunset bid meetings. We have a sunset bid meeting coming up on uh, Monday. And um, that will, I'm sure, also be a topic of conversation. If anybody has questions, we'll let them know what we're doing. As we move a little bit forward in the next week or so, uh, following the trial, uh, getting information out to our local businesses and giving them opportunity to ask questions. Thank you. And then my last thing is, um, it's a good news, bad news story. So um, the good news is, our numbers are improving and some of our businesses are opening. The bad news is I drove down Santa Monica Boulevard yesterday, say it was around four o'clock and the amount of crowding and lines and people just pent up waiting to get into our restaurants and bars, it was a little uh, overwhelming. And again, I get that, you know, people want to get out these places, many of them have not been open, but I'm just wondering um, if there's anything, and, and Kristen, this is probably for you and for Lieutenant Mulder, um, if there's anything that we should be doing, anything that we should be considering, um, I just worry about people's safety. It's extremely concerning and um, extremely frustrating. Uh, because we know how hard our healthcare partners are working still 
Um, there were still almost 60 ICU patients with COVID at Cedars last time uh, I had a brief with them late last week. Um, that doesn't include regular COVID patients. So uh, there are people still sick, there are people still struggling, there are people still losing family members, and um, we, we are not there yet. Um, what you can do is adhere to the health order, encourage everyone you know to adhere to the health order, encourage you know everyone you know, obviously check with your physician, get your vaccination as soon as possible. I think just people's behavior, they're not going to cooperate. So vaccination really is the only way out of this. Um, if I'm speaking with my cynical voice at this point, um, what we've done from the city standpoint, and Lieutenant Mulder mentioned it earlier, but we've staffed up on the sheriff's side, we're escorting co-compliance officers, they've been yelled at, um, you know, people uh, have been, they even yell at our officers, you know, when they're told to put their face covering on or please stay distant from each other. So uh, folks are grumpy and kind of showing that grumpiness. So we're trying to be nice about it, but we're definitely tag teaming with co-compliance and sheriff out there as best we can to manage. Um, on our weekly calls, we do talk with the businesses and we may also talk very specifically with a certain business if we see an issue. Uh, I will say our businesses have been extremely cooperative. Um, they've been willing to help out as we've pointed things out to them. They quickly make adjustments and we're so grateful for that. We have such a great relationship between businesses and Sheriff and Code. Even if they're not happy with us, they're willing to talk to us and find solutions that work. Um, you know, the broader issue really is the community sick of COVID and, and I get it, but we don't have the luxury of giving up yet. We're just not done yet. Thank you. Commissioner Hallman. Yeah, um, Chris, and that leads me to a question then. Um, when are we looking at the Robertson closures? Robertson uh, is going to do their trial uh, area this weekend, and mm -hmm. that's exactly what it is. I mean, Janet and her team are really the experts, but uh, it will be kind of out zone style, you know, what you're already seeing with outdoor dining along Santa Monica. Um, so along the Abbey, uh, things are very restrictive. Uh, yoga will have, you know, designated areas and reservations. Um, so it's, it's adhering to the health order. If it's something that we feel like we can't manage it from a sheriff and fire standpoint, then the pilot will end, if that makes sense. Um, and Janet can jump in if she's got additional details. Yes, thank you, Kristen. Um, yes, what Kristen shared is how the program will work. It's a pilot program. It starts this weekend, but um, we're very conscious of what the health office orders are and what is allowed. So it's basically outdoor dining, um, some outdoor retail and um, outdoor gyms, all with social distancing, six feet apart. We'll have signage to remind the public to um, maintain social distancing, wear their masks. We will have um, representatives from code compliance, um, Bill Mulder's team, uh, Lieutenant Mulder's team on site, and some of our um, parking enforcement staff as well to help manage that as best as possible. So then will we be limiting the amount of people that can go through at any one time? We're not limiting the amount of people. It's more of a pedestrian pathway or promenade, um, but we are limiting the the activations or programming per se of the different vendors, making sure that there's enough space in between quasi booths or that the attendees that come in for yoga class, for instance, don't exceed the space and there's six feet of distancing between them and the area. So um, for instance, we'll have yoga next weekend, the weekend of the 23rd. And I think we determine it's 25 people max that will allow them to maximize the space um, and still allow six feet distancing between them. And one last question, like what are the hours um, for the closure? So it starts at 6 p.m. on Saturday and it goes till 2 a.m. that Monday following. Um, Sunday morning and it, the closure, I'll come back or restart. So it's from El Tovar on the southern portion of Robertson to Santa Monica Boulevard on the northern portion. Um, so that will be at 6 p.m. on Saturdays and we'll go through until 7 a.m. on Sunday mornings where the southern portion of El Tovar, it'll be pushed up just past the Anawalt lumber 
driveway so that their patrons, customers can still have access to their driveway and um, come in. And then at six o'clock when Animal closes, it'll come back to El Tovar and it'll go till 2 a.m. on Monday. Okay. Thank you very much. Of course. Any more questions? Okay, um, Lieutenant Mulder, first of all, before I uh, ask you a couple of things, I wanted to recognize West Siegmiller for his contribution. He put a lot of work into sending our commission some uh, articles about homelessness. And I was able to skim through some of those and they were very enlightening. So thank you very much, West as a resident for contributing to that. That's very helpful. Um, Lieutenant Mulder, on the, um, the postmaster, did you say that you have already contacted the postmaster about those uh, that key? So our, our detectives are in contact with the postmaster about these, um, uh, obviously these number of uh, mail theft crimes that have occurred. And I think, and one of the, um, ideas is changing the key. So that's something that we'll probably be in talks with them about to see if that's something they can do. It's not something that we can control. That's up to them if they want to do it. But it seems as though um, based on video of these crimes that um, the, the, um, the burglars have keys. Okay, thank you. Um, Kristen, we had, a, we had a postmaster come. I don't remember if it was... Um, it was at, at a resident, it was at a, a, a condo and um, we had the postmaster or somebody like the postmaster come, I believe. And um, I remember I, I was even in contact with that postmaster and it really seemed to help. I'm just thinking if we invited that postmaster um, to our meeting or uh, send a message to them um, what their progress is, um, I do have that postmaster's contact information that was before. Um, is there something like that that we can do to make sure that they know that this commission is on this also? Um, Vice Chair Berger, thank you. So I, uh, if you want to reach out to your contact, I think that would be fine just to let he or she know that um, the you know, conversation has kind of come back around again. And then I also would assume that Lieutenant Mulder, you know, will make sure that you know, the right folks on the law enforcement side are also speaking with the right folks on the, you know, the postmaster side as well. The biggest issue is you can imagine, because um, it seems so simple, change the keys, but it's a lot of money for them uh, because that key opens, um, I think thousands of buildings, not just hundreds and hundreds of buildings, but um, I believe that's probably uh, their biggest impediment, but I would defer to Bill on that. Yeah, Kristen's exactly correct. You know, the, the, the master key they use, and I'm not obviously familiar with their entire uh, postal process, but uh, is a master key that's used to get into these types of mailboxes. And in or, you know, to change the key, then all those mailboxes would also need to be changed and how they would manage that or pay for that or accomplish that, I, I'm, I'm not sure. But that's certainly one of the ideas that was floated because of the um, fact that we witnessed burglars using a key. So clearly they have the key. Okay, um, still they need to do it, even if it costs them, in my opinion. Um, so I do think that we need to all contact the one that I have and um, see what is going on with that and what they are doing to, uh, to protect their customers. And the, um, the next thing that I wanted to bring up, Lieutenant Mulder, is um, thank, thank you, Commissioner Balboni, for bringing this up about the, um, the reopening of the businesses. And we had an item for those new commissioners that are on here now. I would say it was a little over a year ago. And um, we had a bunch of uh, the businesses come to our commission and say they were having a lot of problems with the um, transients. So some of us went down and checked out the, the situation and talked with them. And I just was thinking about it and I, I asked uh, Lieutenant Mulder, I was looking through all of the, the reports and I was thinking, I wonder who these people are that are getting arrested by the deputies. So um, Lieutenant Mulder asked, L Lieutenant Mulder sent it to their, uh, their data guy and it was something like 80% of them uh, were transients. And 
So I'm just wondering if what percentage, I know it's not the majority of the transients because when I have gone out before with the, um, the deputies, they have said that it's like 20% of them that are committing 80% of the crime. Can you speak to that a little bit? Because um, if it's just a small group of these people that are doing all of this, this uh, causing this chaos, what you guys might be able to do about that? Yeah, and that's a good question, Commissioner. You know, we've, uh, and I kind of alluded to it earlier in my report that the aggravated assault uh, for the past month, I think the majority were committed by transient individuals. And so, um, and in looking at some of the other crimes when we've identified uh, suspects, uh, either by arrest or um, other, you know, what um, victims or witnesses tell us, um, uh, that um, it, it, they're transient individuals as well. And so uh, that then says to, uh, you know, obviously we have then an issue with um, them committing uh, certain crimes. And uh, then what we then look at is our, our care, care outreach operation to try to contact uh, these folks that um, are doing this and see if we can get them off the street. Uh, and then um, also working with businesses to make sure there's a letter of agency, uh, making sure that when a, an, an event occurs, uh, a theft or, or a minor assault or a vandalism, that they're reporting it to the sheriff station and that a lot of these businesses uh, were especially they're occurring at quite a few businesses and a lot of those businesses have video, then we can identify the individuals that are uh, causing these uh, problems. And um, obviously if no other solution will work trying to get them help, then we're gonna have to look at an, obviously an enforcement solution. And, it's, uh, and then making sure that people that are victims or businesses that are victims are filing criminal reports and then our detectives can go and file these cases on these individuals to try to get them into the system because a lot of times then they might be able to get help through the system as well. Okay, thank you. Um, any commissioners have any follow-up questions? Okay, let's move on to um, discussion on collaboration with Los Angeles Sheriff and Civilian Oversight Commission. Um, Vice Chair Berger, before we do that, let's take a quick look at the 575 document. Um, so every year, especially for newer commissioners, um, commissioners take a look at the sheriff's staffing. All contract cities have a five-year contract with LA County, um, but the five-year contract doesn't actually designate what your level of staffing is. So that 575 chart that we put in your packet is where each contract city or even like the community colleges negotiate with the county, how, how many deputies, what type of teams do we want? Um, what does that look like? So this year uh, staff has been directed to hold kind of a status quo budget due to the reductions in revenues caused by the pandemic. Um, but I do kind of want to just quickly go over the staffing that we have in place, kind of what we cut last year and uh, just get any feedback that you want us to take back uh, to council on your behalf. Um, so if everyone, uh, does anyone need a minute to pull up this? Oops, sorry, you can't really see it with my new background, but the, the spreadsheet, we good to get I can started? share the screen if you'd like. Uh, yeah, Thank yeah, share that great. please. Okay. Thank you. Um, so our first major category is the deputy sheriff 70 hour unit category. And that's what we call, uh, contract city calls it general law. We kind of refer to it casually as patrol. Um, so in West Hollywood and Lieutenant Mulder and I were verifying numbers uh, earlier today, we have about 57 deputies assigned to the city. There's an additional 23 deputies assigned to the county area. So they come out of West Hollywood Station, but they're either, they're headed over to Universal. Um, and so in that patrol line, we're actually contracting for minutes, not actual people, if that makes sense. So it's up to the county how they wanna staff those contracted minutes just to make sure that we're getting um, what we're contracting for, what we're paying for in that general law line. So each month, 
Um, there's a team at the station that reviews our contracted minutes and circles back with us at the city to make sure everything is on target. Um, so if you move to the next line, the special assignment deputy, non-relief, those nine deputies are assigned to Lieutenant Mulder and Sergeant Lapkin, and they make up the entertainment policing team at night and the community oriented policing and problem solving team during the day. So last July one, we went from 10 to nine um, during some of the cuts that we did last summer based on, again, revenue, significant revenue reductions from the pandemic. At the time, that 10th deputy was out on injury. So we just froze that position um, and kept the staffing at nine. If you go to the next line, um, our deputy sheriff bonus, that deputy is our MET deputy and is a specialized deputy. So it's slightly more expensive per um, unit, so to speak. Um, and I should say the special assignment deputies, you're actually contracting for nine people. So it's not units like uh, patrol is. So the Met deputy is a person um, that we contract for. Kind of moving down toward the bottom, um, we have two motor deputy, deputies. So those are the traffic deputies that you see riding motorcycles. We have one service area lieutenant, you all know that is Bill Mulder. We have one um, Sergeant Fanny Lapkin, although also with us tonight. And uh, that, this is where we did another freeze from last year. Uh, Sergeant John Klaus, when he retired last summer, we kept the position frozen again due to budget cuts from the um, pandemic. The operations assistant and the LETs, the law enforcement technicians right below, and the station clerk are all. Um, civilian personnel at the station that assist with various things. One of our LETs does fingerprinting, um, which is a specialty item that we added uh, several years ago, uh, but it was to help offset the delay of having somebody respond from outside our station. What you won't see on here, and Commissioner Roche asked a good question earlier in the day today about um, the Department of Mental Health clinician. So that clinician costs about 176,000 a year. And that's a, a direct bill from the Department of Mental Health. So you don't see that civilian person on this sheriff staffing list. Other items that you don't see on the 575, but that you would see in the actual budget document that the city is also public. It's last year's is on our website. Um, this year's is still being developed to be reviewed by the council subcommittee and our city manager. Um, but over time for park patrols, uh, foot patrols on the east side, you know, Robertson patrols, we have uh, a column in our budget supplemental funding. It's uh, at $900,000 to kind of cover those patrols. So you don't see that 900,000 directly on this 575, if that makes sense. The other items that are show up in the actual budget, but not on the 575 are staffing for major events, which this year was obviously cut to zero. Um, so Halloween, Pride, Marathon, you know, all those big events uh, we do budget for, assuming we're in a non-pandemic year, uh, but they are not a contracted item with the sheriff, if that makes sense. It's something that we uh, budget for like any other city program. Um, the liability is a big chunk of what we pay. So as you'll see this year, we're about 19,300,000 uh, and the liability is almost $2 million of that. So that rate is set by um, JPIA and is very high right now at 11%. Uh, during my time in West Hollywood, it's been as low as zero. I would say the average is around six. Um, and so we're hoping that uh, through additional training the Sheriff's Department has done, uh, that things will come down in that regard, but also just uh, litigation has increased just in general, not necessarily at the fault of the Sheriff's Station, but uh, more claims are being made today than, than there were um, at the beginning of my career, let's just say, uh, for whatever reason. Um, trying to see all my notes here. Uh, the other things that show up in the public safety budget are funds for EMS and fire. 
that are outside our day to day. So that would be things like Pride, Halloween, special projects. Um, and I think that about covers it. We also pay a, a company to monitor our AED machines. There's a medical director that's required and also monthly checks that happen from that company. So that company's name is CPR1 and that's something that comes out of the public safety budget as well. On the administrative side of the public safety bu budget, which we're not talking about today, uh, that's where we pay for block by block, PAC West, our, our um, contract with the Gay and Lesbian Center for the Domestic Violence Counselor that we fund and also our contract with um, the Maple Counseling Center uh, for counseling services for our residents as well. That started kind of as a crisis public safety related thing, but Maple has been great and broadened that to additional services. So with that, I'll take any questions. I will say, because commission asked about this before we start is, um, you know, if, if we were to do anything, how much would it cost to add an additional MET team? Um, so the deputy is plus the MET deputy plus the DMH clinician plus the liability insurance is about 525 to 530,000. Um, we have set that aside, like flagged it separately for our internal staff budget folks, just so they can see if, if that's something that can be considered at some point, whether it's this July one or even at mid-year, um, that just so they know exactly how much that is. The county has graciously offered to work with us on the cost of the deputy for the first year, um, but we would also have to fund their vehicle, which is kind of a wash, you know? So basically, even if the cost of the deputy comes down, we still need to fund their specialty vehicle because it's not a traditional patrol car, as you know. Um, so I, again, the amount is still about half a million dollars. And with that, I'll take any questions. Commissioner Roche. Um, I just wanna thank you so much, Kristen, for reporting on all of this. I really appreciate the transparency. Um, I just really wanna clarify these numbers here. So you mentioned that a portion of it will be paid by the Department of Health. Am I misunderstanding that aspect? Maybe. Uh, sorry, I probably misspoke. The city pays the Department of Mental Health for the clinician. Um, oh, so. so we, are, we city of West Hollywood, are paying the Department of Health. That's they correct. provide the clinician. That's correct. correct. Right. Okay. So we are still there's still an output, and that cost is about roughly. The clinician is 176,000. 176. A little bit of overtime here and there, but that that amount stayed pretty consistent over the last few years. And the total being around 550, you said for both the sheriffs. Yes, it's, if we do full cost of deputy DMH clinician plus the 11% liability, it's 528,000 and change. Right, um, liability. Discounted deputy, but need to because of that need to pay the car. It's a little bit less than that, but it's essentially this you know a similar hit about half a million dollars. Um. So, are there additional breakdowns within the Met? So, for instance, do we have an idea of what makes up one hundred seventy six thousand dollars for these clinicians from the Department of Health? Like, are they able to provide a breakdown that? that's able to itemize why it costs 176,000? Yes, so it is a 40 hour a week staff person. Um, that is the county's billing rate for that staff person. So while I don't know exactly what that clinician takes home in their paycheck, because that would be protected information, um, but I would assume it's their base salary plus you know, um, overhead, you know, their, their benefits, you know, whatever the county uh, has to pay to have that person, um, Got it. that makes sense. Got it. And the same thing applies for the sheriffs. So the one... is, it's a little trickier. And um, the simple answer is, you know, Bill does not make what you see on this piece of paper, right? And the overhead goes into training, um, their equipment, the cars, the cost of the radio, electricity, toilet paper. I mean, it just overhead goes into uh, running the station. So 
at our station, we also have, um, uh, we have 12 detectives, we have five watch deputies, you know, who kind of work the front. There are 39 professional staff. We have Captain Ramirez and additional watch commanders and field lieutenant and sergeants. And we don't pay directly for them, even though it takes all of those people to run the station. Um, the way the county has done this over the years is the CEO's office sets a billable rate for each contract for each contracted item that a contract city chooses. And within that item, the overhead in theory pays for the, the rest of the stuff you know that it takes to run the station. So is the cost separate or is it the same? Does it fall within? It seems like we're getting billed to have share to ha we're in contract with the sheriff's department and we are getting billed to have their presence here. And then on top of that, as a bonus, we're paying a separate fee for Met. But it so, also sounds like some of those some of those costs are also supporting sheriff's department on top of that. Right. So I would say, like, if you look at um, a similar size deployment from a full service city, it costs us less to contract with the county um, because a lot of their larger items can be um, allocated across the whole county. So it is much cheaper to contract with the sheriff station than it is to be a full service city at the same size of deployment. Um, and it's just, you know, how this was put together 30, 40 years ago when they first started doing contracts is the county decided we're not going to bill you for your captain, but we're going to bill you for the lieutenant how and why that happened once upon a time, you know, I, I don't really know that predates me and most of my peers across contract cities. What I can tell you is um, we, we look at kind of the overall, like, what does it take? If you had a hundred deputies, what would that cost you as a full service city? What does that cost you as a contracted city? Are you getting, are we getting our money's worth, so to speak, you know, is, uh, Lieutenant Mulder, and sorry to keep picking on you, Bill, but like, is Lieutenant Mulder giving us his four plus hours a week and, you know, following city's requests and policy? I mean, that, that's where we really look at things. Um, there was a study probably, um, God, it may even be 10 years ago now, but maybe eight or nine years ago, that some of the contract city, city managers took a look at contracts. Are we being overbilled for that sergeant? You know, even though we're not paying for the captain, are we being overbilled on the sergeant? And what they found at the time, again, is the, you know, kind of what we see when we compare ourselves to full service cities is that th while some of the billing's a little wonky, we're still coming out ahead um, overall, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. And I appreciate detectives. I, I can't tell you how that happened years ago because every detective that works West Hollywood cases, we, we are not billed for directly. Oh, okay. You know, I asked, I'm curious how resources are being utilized, you know, in terms of allocating funds towards trainings. I know I hear a lot of um, deputies or officers wanting more training. We are now, you know, under our purview, really want to emphasize trainings and so just trying to get a better understanding of how our resources are being allocated how our funds are being allocated and if there's a better way so Absolutely. thank you there's also benefit to being um part of like bigger county i'll give you an example for upcoming protests or marches let's hope they're marches and not protests but um those response teams that lieutenant Mulder described we are not billed for uh, so that is something that kind of comes as being contract city, part of the county package. Um, that's what you get. If we need SWAT, so um, Special Enforcement Bureau has to show up for something, uh, we're not billed for that. Homicide investigator, not billed for that. So, and again, um, there's a, a lot of specialty teams that because the county is so big, they can support those large teams where other agencies um, like Burbank, Glendale, Pasadena, and you know, on the fire side, one of them has urban search and rescue and the other two don't. And one of them has hazmat and the other two don't. So they've kind of knitted together this little system that works for those three big cities. Um, and so those of us as contract cities, those resources come to us. I don't wanna say for free, cause again, you know, we're paying each item, we're paying more than that person takes home in their paycheck, but uh, that is a very large benefit to being a contract city, being part of the county family. Excellent questions, Commissioner Roche. 
Does anybody else have any questions? Commissioner Balbon. It's more of a comment than a question. As I listen to the Measure J conversation, if we want to avoid incarceration, it almost starts with the MET teams, right? Because if you don't have someone to de-escalate and direct, then you get into what we're seeing sometimes now. So um, one of the things that I think we should consider is with additional funding potentially available countywide, will we have a better opportunity to potentially help people in crisis because of the fact that we'll have potentially met? Because that's the thing I worry about with all of this funding that's gonna be happening to be alternatives to incarceration, the outreach to people and how they connect with the system. I hate to say it, but today it's through law enforcement. And if there's not a wrapper around law enforcement to get them connected to these services like MET teams, I don't know that the services will be optimized um, until we see you know, change and that's gonna be muscle that has to be developed. So it's just one of those things, Kristen, that as we think about met and needing more versus less, less, it may be good. And to me, it would only be good if we figure out how to connect to some of the services that are coming um, countywide through Measure J. Right. And we're definitely monitoring that. And uh, West Hollywood has a history for funding social services at a, a percentage that you do just do not see in other cities. Um, one, we are blessed to be able to do that again in normal years. Um, and uh, two, it's been the vision of the city council from day one to, um, to fund social services at that percentage. So it is rare, again, I would say, especially if you look at full service cities for the sheriff's budget to be 20% of your general fund. You know, law enforcement usually eats a much bigger percentage than that. And Janet could probably help me with the dollar amount, but I wanna say our social services programs are around five, six million um, as well, which is a, again, a big percentage that you just don't see. And so I, I'm grateful for our council members who've always looked at it as a partnership. It's not just law enforcement, it's law and social services. It's also block by block. Um, you know, we fund block by block at, at a significant amount and also PacWest. I mean, their contracts, again, were reduced this year due to the COVID reductions, but there's, you know, a million and a half uh, to almost two million in some years of, you know, non-sworn public safety partnerships as well. And uh, not to say we don't have a lot of work to do, and we certainly have a lot to learn, uh, but the city has always had the foresight to make those collaborations um, ahead of time, which is which has been nice for us. And because as you all know, it's not just one thing that's the answer. It's the little puzzle piece. It's catching folks on the right day with the right resource that works um, works for them so that they can actually get the assistance that they need. Any other questions? Okay. Um I would like to recommend that this is a really important part of our commission. This is under our purview and we really haven't addressed it this much. And Kristen, thank you for that excellent uh, explanation because we haven't had that uh, before in previous years like this. Um, I would like to suggest that we, um, we pour over this as commissioners and really think about it. And um, Kristen, if you could send the link to this um, YouTube recording to whoever comes into our commission, the at large, too, so that they can have time to look at this and that um, we think about this and what, what kind of re resources in that, those kinds of things that we want to recommend to council. And um, I, uh, Chair Laughlin, I'm sure, wants to be involved in this conversation. And, um, and that way we can make some recommendations with some, some really solid backing and analysis if we, if we would like to. So, and Kristen, um, the presentation that you uh, made to council last week, um, is it too difficult if you could send that to our commissioners, those that didn't have a chance to see that marked at the place? So 
I mean, it took me a long time to try to go through the council to finally find where our, our part was. Um, if you could send that to uh, the to the commissioners and of those in the in the public, um, if you want those kinds of, this kind of information, you can contact uh, staff also. And yes, I'd be happy to figure out where in the video it starts, but it is public. It is on the website already. Okay. Thank but you. I'll, I'll, I'll find out like it. Yeah, because you can you minutes. can find it and then you can send us that link right to where it starts. You got it. It's really save us time. Okay. Um, no more questions. Any comments from Lieutenant Mulder? Okay, let's move on to um, the update on, well, I think he may have covered this, update on impacts from cookies. Lieutenant Mulder, do you have any more additional information on that? Uh, nothing additional except for what I, 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 co I covered in my uh, comments. So obviously very concerning having that uh, illegal shooting occurring in the area and related, uh, we believe related to cookies. So, um, um, you know, we, we wait till they have their next commission to still uh, advocate next commission hearing to advocate with them at the, uh, the cannabis regulation commission. Okay. Thank you. Um, and we're going to move on to block by block, the report from block by block and I'm block by there. Sorry to interrupt, and Shay, sorry, I know you've been holding on for so long, but we just need to quickly um, get approval from you all to host a joint meeting in June with the Sheriff Civilian Oversight Commission. Um, they would like to have the topic oh. of mental health and homelessness, and we're looking at holding that meeting the night of your regular commission meeting, so that would be Monday, June 14th. Um, the chair and the vice chair would be panelists along with some of the civilian oversight commission uh -huh. commissioners um, as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we will also provide, uh, you know, Met will be on, um, Corey Plank will identify a few so, uh, service providers that will be on the panel as well. Um, so before we move any farther with uh, the civilian oversight commission, I just want to say their staff is fantastic. They, they are so nice. Um, they've met with us two or three times uh, since our last commission meeting, and uh, they will be the host for this. The meeting will be on WebEx. It'll be you know open to the public like their regular meetings are. Um, they're really just <laughs> they're doing the whole thing, so it's it's they're just fantastic. Um, but just want to make sure uh, that the commission is comfortable uh, with the date, uh, knowing that it will be in lieu of your regular commission meeting. Um, that you are aware of the topic and that also that chair and vice chair will be panelists. Thank you. Um, does, should we just take a consensus on this? Um, anybody have objections to that? I just have a question. Um, does it, and I know that we're in an awkward spot for this, does it make sense to have, you know, either a subcommittee or some focused group um, of a couple of commissioners sit down and help prepare for that meeting? So it'll be the chair and the vice chair um, okay. will be looped in. But before we started that work, we kind of needed, you know, permission, so to speak, from all of you as a commissioners that okay. we're good with the date, we're good with the idea, good with the topic. And then yes, we will be looping in the chair and vice chair for those discussions on um, how it's actually gonna roll out. Okay. And I think I can speak for um, Chair Laughlin also. We would appreciate any kind of information or questions that you guys may have ahead, anything that you think might be helpful to uh, email to us as well. Okay, um, so I, I, okay. If I could just add, just to, to ensure that there was, there's no serial meeting, any comments or questions um, that the other commissioners would have would come to Kristen and I. And then okay. we would route that to the, the chair and the vice chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else have any more questions before we move on? Okay, so um, we're going to go with a report by block by block. And Shay, um, when you give us this report, if you can just, you don't really need to read all of it, each thing. We can see that ourselves. We get the reports. Anything that stands out to you. Um, go ahead, Shay. Uh, good evening, commissioners and city staff. Shay Gibson here, block by block. 
Uh, we'll go over the March reports for Santa Monica, Sunset, as well as uh, Plummer Park. Um, not too many, well, since I'm not reading the numbers like that, not too many things uh, have differed. We have uh, did decline a little bit on, uh, on the hospitality uh, assistance side as far as Santa Monica goes. Um, bike miles written have uh, dropped off a little bit as well due to uh, maintenance issues. Um, not on this report at all, though. I have seen the, uh, an increase in graffiti around the city, uh, most of it up on Sunset, but there has been a, an increase uh, outside of the park boundaries uh, in, on Santa Monica Boulevard as well. Um, also, we've been seeing uh, an increase in uh, new homeless and new homeless faces. So we've been trying to uh, make contact with all of them, try to get familiar with them as best as possible um, to see how we can best uh, connect them with service providers and or assist them in, in any way that we can. Um, there was an increase in the Plummer Park restroom counts, um, but that's simply because uh, people are, the restrooms are open now. So there, we're not just, uh, we don't just have the restrooms open for the tennis patrons only now, the, the entire park Whoever visits the park, they can use the restrooms freely now as well. Um, the parks are getting cleaned uh, every hour uh, by DM, DMH. And then we are also sub uh, cleaning those restrooms as well uh, in between those times. So um, that's really about it. Um, are there any questions with anything? Commissioner Balbon. Um, good evening, Shay, and thank you. Um, I do have a question and it's related to um, I had a call one early morning and what I did not know is that you have a schedule uh, and I think it would be good for us to understand how that schedule works, where you're covering yeah. certain sections of town at different times and how that changes just so that we can understand that. Okay. Yeah, no problem. So we do have a set schedule for Melrose, uh, for instance, a set uh, shift with that. And that goes from uh, 1.30 to 10 o'clock at night. We usually try to bring the guys back from that side of town around uh, 915, 930-ish. Um, we also, of course, our morning schedule goes from um, 530 to 2 p.m. Uh, then we have uh, the next shift that comes in on Mondays and Tuesdays. Uh, they come in at 330 um, and stay all the way to 12. Um, Wednesday on until uh, Sunday, we have a 12 uh, 30 team that also comes. Um, then we go into the nighttime hours. Okay. So the overnight hours would be uh, our seven o'clock team, which goes up to sunset. And then our eight o'clock team, which patrols Santa Monica Boulevard in the West End. So in the overnights, there's, or there's, there's no overnight or early morning on Melrose then. That's correct, yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Hallman. Um, thank you. Um, I don't know if this is for she or Kristen. I know this is something that I mentioned, Kristen, actually before I was appointed as a commissioner, um, adding somewhat of a permanent block by block station at the corner of Santa Monica and La Brea around the Dillon. Um, because I just noticed what an improvement the permanent station provided in Plummer Park. And since we're on the border with LA and so many different things happen on that corner, and we have new businesses that are finally moving into the Dillon. Um, I just think it would be beneficial. And I think it was a budget issue, correct? And if I'm correct, block by block was not included in the budget that you just presented? Um, that's correct, Commissioner Holman. So um, block by block is a separate budget, separate from the sheriff's. Uh, just so you're aware, uh, we as staff did note for the budget staff, if we were to increase block by blocks, contract, how much approximately it costs per ambassador. Um, again, you have to contract for a person. So that's, you know, 40 hours worth of time throughout the week. 
um, because having a permanent station near Santa Monica and La Brea, uh, we agree is a great idea as well. So it's just a matter of, you know, revenues turning for the positive and uh, the city being able to fund additional projects. Um, we're just not clear from, uh, you know, with it still being April, I was about to say March, but with it still being April, you know, how the revenues are gonna look as we head toward the summer. Um, I do anticipate, I am not a financial wizard of any sort and our budget folks are the right people to answer these questions, but I do anticipate our revenues in the city to rebound. Um, when and you know how quickly uh, remains to be seen. So that is something that's on the top of our list is to be able to give Shea additional resources for projects just like that, because you're exactly right. Um, the difference that it made in the parks is, is really remarkable. And it could help um, answer the continued question that I still get as the East Side Neighborhood Watch Captain of, are we ever gonna have a sheriff substation? And again, I know you and I had those conversations prior to me being appointed. Um, maybe this could be a solution. I, I love that idea because, uh, you know, a substation, you know, it's, you guys saw how expensive it is to fund a deputy. So do we spend, you know, $300,000 on a deputy and put that deputy inside of a building or do we spend $300,000 on a deputy and put that deputy on patrol? So um, I think, uh, Commissioner Allman, that's a great, idea um, is to be able to, to pitch that, you know, and again, not to say a substation is impossible, but, you know, as we're making these funding choices going forward with funding being so tight right now, um, you know, I, I personally would advocate for additional block by block in this moment um, in the configuration that you described. Thank you. And Shay, thank you um, to you and your team for all that you do. Greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for your support. Great comments. Commissioner Hallman. Do we have any more questions or comments? Commissioner Roche? Good evening, Shay. Good evening. Um, would you be able to email your breakdown of hours of operation? I was trying to write them down as you were sharing them, but sure. I, I just didn't cut it. So that would be really helpful. Thank you. No problem. No problem. And then Kristen, there, go ahead. I'm sorry. Is there a certain... Um, to get your email. <laughs> so can I get it through? Can you send it to me and I'll forward? Um, okay, sounds good. Thank sounds you. Good. No problem. And then also, Kristen, I know that you shared that there is a cost breakdown for Pack West and Block by Block. I think they all get grouped together in terms of a budget. Would you be able to share that with uh, the commissioners and myself? Yes, I'd be um, happy to send you copies of our existing, con we did a one year contract amendment last year to kind of get us through the quote COVID year. Um, we're looking at doing that again, um, this July one, all that has not been decided yet by um, you know those that make the policy. Uh, in addition, and a conversation not to get into tonight, but just to flag it with the new facilities coming online at West Hollywood Park at some point in late, um, 2021, I don't remember which year we're in, you know, that's also going to take <laughs> staffing, you know, uh, security ambassadors to um, kind of keep an eye on the restrooms for us, uh, you know, uh, fixed post security like PacWest inside the building. Um, there's, there's a lot to be determined there um, later. So we've also kind of given very rough costs, thanks to Shay and um, his colleagues, and also on the PacWest side, working with recreation and facilities on what we think those costs may be someday. So, um, so finance is preparing for those as well. Is there a way to get a comparison from 2019 and 2020 and then the projected? Yes, for 20. Um, so the the not pre-pandemic year, pre-pandemic year, absolutely. The projections for the park, not quite yet. They're okay. still in a draft form because they're part of a much bigger um, park, new park discussion um, that's still in flux. But just so you have a rough dollar amount in your mind, it's about fifty thousand dollars per forty hours of service. Okay, sounds good. And I also am curious to learn more about what was done at Plummer Park in terms of block by block. And maybe there's, maybe I missed a report, but I would love to know more about the benefits of that and what came out of it because I fully support the idea of putting 
more block by block by La Brea and Santa Monica? Yes, and the short answer is um, block by block uh, did a more like fixed post inside the park um, right. to assist with uh, restrooms and patrons. And not that they don't walk around, but it was more of a kiosk style uh, setup. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm guessing that there was a report that was generated based on, I don't know how long it was stationary. I don't know when those dates were, if it was like a six month pilot program. I, I'm not familiar, but it would be really great to see. Yes, I will look up those council items as well. I, I remember it being November, but November of which year, um, I'd have to go back and take a look. Commissioner Balbon. So um, one of the things that would really help me is understanding if we have a connection between when, say, there's a sheriff's call, someone needs an assistance with whether it's, you know, something they see, something that happens with a, you know, a, a transient person who is um, threatening them or what have you, and how many missed calls we have and what that does with block by block in the hours, because I just don't understand for me, how do we decide block by blocks additional span and where we place them? I understand the park side because we've seen that, but um, if we start to staff more people on the east side that could push people to the west side, if we don't on the west side, you see what I'm saying? So. I think that one of the things that we have to think about is um, those sections of town where we may have calls that are either unanswered. And I just, that's the thing that I think about and I don't know how we do that. So it would be so helpful to we, me to we understand that, that. Scientifically, and we do it based off complaints and okay. nuisance issues. So um, as Lieutenant Mulder mentioned earlier, uh, we look at part one crimes when it comes to our resources that address crime, and those are sheriff's deputies. Um, we also look at block by block and PacWest contracts as um, assisting in that, that they may deter crime just by their presence, um, but they are not the folks that respond to crime. Um, block by block really evolved over the years because they're so good at what they do. Uh, they started on Sunset as a kind of relationship building between nighttime entertainment establishments and a major commercial corridor, Sunset Boulevard, um, walking people to their cars, giving directions, pedestrian assistance for uh, folks who are intoxicated going across the street, just kind of, and that's really where we started. Because they were so good at relationship building, deterring crime, um, handling quality of life and nuisance type issues, we expanded down to Santa Monica Boulevard because the, really the businesses down there were like, wait a minute, why, why do they have that? And we don't have that. You know? And at the time, Sunset, again, doing it from a scientific standpoint, Sunset was much busier at the time with calls for service than Santa Monica was at the time. Um, the two streets, I think, would give each other a run for their money now. I'll be curious to see how it uh, comes back to life um, once we're a little more back to normal. Um, but we add, we've added block by block resources. We just started in the West side because that's where we were busiest. But then, as you all know, we had nightlife kind of in the middle of the city toward the Hudson. So we went a little bit to the middle um, again, because the original intent was that intersection of nighttime entertainment establishments and residential areas and also protecting our visitors. Because they were such uh, an amazing resource, we started staffing them to assist with homelessness issues and stretched it all the way to the east side because while we don't have the same entertainment issues uh, on the east side that we do on the west side we definitely had a handful of similar nuisance quality of life type issues and so that's kind of how block by block evolved over the years so while the crime data wasn't generating entertainment related calls on the east side because they were such a successful tool in the entertainment districts we transitioned them into a different arena to help with other quality of life and nuisance type issues. But we adjust schedules based on need, based on calls, okay. based on complaints, and based on um, crime data. So that's really helpful, Kristen. And I figured that that was something that we were looking at. One of the things with the um, Robertson opening we may want to think about is 
that's going to push parking and traffic down to Melrose because they can't do it on Santa Monica. It's already backed up. There's not a lot of parking, but it's going to push more people at night down to Melrose. And I think we're just going to have to take a look at that potentially because, you know, that area right now, certain spans of it, there's, there are businesses and then certain spans it's dead zone and it just, people could get lost and then you have all of the residential, the housing that's around there. And I just, I, I don't know, there could be an opportunity. So I'm sure that's the kind of thing that you guys are gonna be studying when we start this weekend. Yes. But it's one of the things I think about as I kind of walk around. Yeah, as we shut Robertson for um, our major events, uh, it kind of causes its own traffic pattern and sometimes traffic nightmare. Um, and so we'll be addressing that. We already have assigned sheriff's deputies to the closure just to monitor again, hopefully just happy, smiley deputies saying hello. And that's the, those are the only issues that we have, but um, they are prepared to assist with traffic concerns or if the crowd starts to get uh, to the point where it's violating the health order. And Kristen, if I could add to, to Commissioner Balbone's comments, um, we will have additional signage indicating where parking is available. So whether it's the five story, the uh, small lot off of Melrose, the small lot by the log cabin off of Robertson. And then there's also a private lot that's normally accessed from Robertson right across from the Abbey. Um, but our staff has worked with them and there's access for them on the Lapeer side. So we will have um, plenty of signage for parking as well as parking enforcement present in the neighborhood to ensure that patrons aren't parking in permit parking areas and have definite, very uh, pertinent signage as um, patrons are entering the residential neighborhood just so they know um, that it is permit parking area and they would be cited. Good, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner Balbone. Very good questions and nice dialogue. Um, do we have any more questions on that item? I have one comment, Kristen. What, um, it reminded me when you spoke about how we hire the block by block by 40 hours. And I think you mentioned that with the MET teams. Um, do we have the flexibility to hire a MET team for the hours overnight? Because I think Pro Tem Meister mentioned something like we are, there's a gap there. Yes, there is a gap. Um, what we're looking at is trying to staff it uh, with some overtime hours. And I, I'm kind of saying this a little prematurely, but so uh, strategic initiative staff and I have been speaking with Lieutenant Gannon on, um, is there a way uh, that maybe we could do a couple of eight hour shifts here and there uh, to cover some of the hours that aren't there? Basically, um, the short answer is no, there isn't a DMH clinician that wants to work the graveyard shift, like wants to work overnight. Um, and so, uh, and also uh, they've done their staffing based on the calls that are generated as well. And they're matched very well to our calls for service. But if we did move to 24 hour service, um, you know, like having a law enforcement officer, it's mandated that we're covered 24 hours. It is not mandated that uh, DMH provides clinicians countywide 24 hours a day. Um, I see that in our future at some point, you know, just because it is such a successful, good model. Um, but the clinician has to be willing uh, to work those hours. So we're going to dip our toe in a little bit in the pool and just see um, how some overtime staffing works uh, if we're able to, to get that going um, and kind of, you know, get there, so to speak. Okay, thank you. And keep that in mind. Um... Those who may be coming on our commission at large too, and while you're reading this or watching this, um, those kinds of things so we can make recommendations to council. Next um, subcommittee, uh, next item is items from subcommittees. Okay, items from staff. I do have one comment, um, uh, Vice Chair Berger. Um, piggybacking on what Shay shared about the, the restrooms being open at the parks. So last week, our city manager did execute an executive order that among other things, reopened the parks or reopened the restrooms at the parks where before it was only for the tennis courts. Um, and it also rescinded a previous allowance for businesses to be able to board up their windows. And that was early on during the pandemic when everything was shut down and for safety reasons. But as things are starting to open up, um, there's more pedestrians along the sidewalks and there's more activity um, that was rescinded. And so businesses will have to unboard their 
they're occupied businesses. Um, if they are vacant, there's opportunities to do creative signage or other things that our staff can work with them on. Um, but that is forthcoming and code compliance will be reaching out to those businesses. Okay, thank you. Um, any more public comments? None, Chair, Vice Chair. Items from the commission, commissioner comments. Commissioner Balbon. So um, first I wanted to um, thank Kristen. I think you did a really great job at the council meeting this past week. Um, one of the things that has come up and that I sent a note on is regarding the idea of scheduling or agendizing a calendar for the fo for focus areas in this meeting. And I know one of the things that you brought up is that we've actually been doing it um, not by, I shouldn't say not by design. We haven't set it up in advance, but we have been doing very topical agendas. And I just wonder if we wouldn't benefit from looking at the calendar and scheduling it out. Some of that I know you have guided us towards, particularly in the past when we have big events, usually a month or two before we're focused on event safety. But I just wonder if there isn't um, something we could do more formally. Um, and I sent a list of just thoughts. Some of it came from the actual things we've talked about in the meetings, but I don't know if it makes sense to cal calendar them out in a different way. So I just bring that up because it's something I've heard come up in the council meeting twice now, and it might be a nice way to also prepare some of the people we want to bring to come to speak with us. Right. And I'll just say council members have been talking to us on the side, you know, before they've said it publicly. And that's why you've been seeing a lot of guest speakers at your meetings, because we're just kind of trying it out, see how it feels. Um, and we like it. So for May, we're going to have a speaker from Susan Holt's team at the Gay and Lesbian Center, the, uh, excuse me, the Los Angeles LGBT Center, um, the contract that uh, the city funds out of public safety for their domestic violence counselor. So they're going to prevent present next commission meeting um, on their domestic violence uh, resources that they offer. Again, once all our commissioners are seated, um, then what we envision is giving you all some topics. Obviously we feel very strongly that MET should be a regular item, code compliance is gonna be a regular item, but you know, we wanna hear from all of you on suggestions on how else we fill out the calendar for the year. Great, thank you. Excellent comments, Commissioner Balboni. Thank you, and Kristen Cook. Uh, Commissioner Roche, do you have some? Yes, thank you, Vice Chair Berger. Um, I have three things, I believe. Uh, one, I would love to, I don't know if this is standard practice, but it would be really great to have a business card that had a list of services because I, as a resident, I spend as much time as I can walking around the city and it would be really great to be of resource and impact for those who I do happen to come in contact with that are unhoused and would love to connect them with services directly versus, um, I don't know, if I can make a direct connection I feel like that would be helpful. So I don't know if that's possible. I know, um, I believe Vice Chair Berger has business cards that he's been able to use to uh, hand out. And I believe that you might actually have some services like business cards specifically for services, social services. Is that correct? We do have um, homeless outreach cards. Um, obviously right now, you know, we don't really want you all uh, kind of Oh, yeah, with folks against the health order, but yes, is the short answer. Um, yes, you should all have business cards for yourself and you get to decide what's on there. Again, I've been holding off on your parking passes and your business cards till we can get everybody seated. Also, you should not be going to any in-person meetings. So there hasn't been a need for parking passes yet, for example. And then we also have homeless outreach services cards as well that the social services division put together. They're a little bit bigger than a business card, but they're still pretty small. So I can check with them to see if they have those as well for you. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, I understand everything else is on hold, um, but if uh, we can have some of those mailed out, I would love a stack of them. Yes, don't worry, I'm not 
in full and engagement with our unhoused. Um, but nevertheless, it's part of my, you know, they're still part of the community. So uh, I will have my days where I will like to at least hand them a card. Uh, the second thing is the WeHo app. I'm not sure if the WeHo app has been a topic of conversation within the commission and how we can utilize it better. I don't know if there's been trainings. Uh, I would love to be trained on the app so I can continue to educate other members of the community on how to use it and the best way to use it in terms of public safety. That would be great. We could have um, staff uh, from inside City Hall kind of talk about how it works. Um, Lieutenant Mulder and I get requests from the app through those staff almost daily. Uh, obviously, we always want to make sure people are calling the sheriff station for anything criminal or an immediate concern. Obviously, 911 for emergencies, but the app has been very helpful. You know, we get, you know, tree limb down here, or I noticed a person um, that may need assistance over there. Obviously, not an emergency assistance, but uh, it's been very helpful for us. Okay, excellent. Yes, I would love to be trained on it, and maybe that's something we hold off until. We have everyone on board on our commission. Um, and then the other thing is our previous agendas. I had an opportunity to go online and review some of the previous agendas because, you know, it'd be great to not ask you for everything, Kristen. Even though you're fantastic at delivering, I would be nice to not ask you for every single thing and be more self-sufficient in this process. So when I logged into the city's website, I noticed that the hyperlinks were missing from the um, previous agendas. Is there any way we can create permanent links on these agendas so I can access reports that have been pre previously shared and published? Sure. So I'll have to talk to the city clerk about that because it's usually the current agenda packet is the one that's posted for boards commissions. I think even council, though there's another way to look that up for council meetings that I don't think exists for commissions in the same way. So let me brainstorm with the city clerk. And then also there's a certain report, you know, like tonight's hate crime report that we just want to post on its own on the website. We can do that as well, but I'll talk to Melissa and find out what's best. Yeah. Well, on that note, I have a list of reports that I would love to have posted on the website. I just wasn't sure if there needs to be a consensus, etc. But if we can create a standard practice, I think that'd be really helpful for transparency. Sure, I mean, we definitely have internal rules um, governed by our communications department on what gets posted on the website. But um, you know, if things are pretty straightforward and we're talking about them at Public Safety Commission, it should be pretty easy to post some of those reports, at least on the public safety pages. So just shoot me an email with what you had in mind, and then um, we'll figure out the best way to do that. Sounds great. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Commissioner Hallman. Uh, thank you. I'm Vice Chair Berger. Um, I know at the top of the meeting, we talked about uh, the neighborhood captain's meeting that Jasmine hosted, the city, which I thought was very successful. Uh, we've actually done them in person, not always a large turnout, but this one I thought was very successful. And um, Commissioner Ambroche, thank you for your comments that you made. I'm glad I was able to give um, some insight. Um, I know it is last minute, but tomorrow night we are having an East Side co-captains meeting. So um, I would love to invite you if you want to jump on. Um, we're actually expanding our area. So maybe, you know, there'll be more information for you there and Jasmine will also be part of that meeting. So I'll make sure you get an invite. And then the other thing, um, Kristen is aware of this. I have recently joined, we have not met yet, but the sheriff um, has formed a CAC community advisory commission. And I will be joining that. Um, so I would love to keep my fellow commissioners apprised of the work that we're doing in that program. Excellent, thank you, Commissioner Hallman. Um, we had, oh, Commissioner Balbone. I did wanna share with Commissioner Roche, um, if you go to the city's website under um, commissions and you click on our commission, there will be a link to all of the old reports and all of the old agendas, but you've got to go in that way versus the, the agendas link. It's kind of a weird back way into it. 
and I go in there to look at some of the old stuff every once in a while just to look at my notes, but they are posted and the reports from all three areas, fire, um, police, uh, fire, sheriff, and block by block are there too. You just kind of have to keep digging and going through them, but they're all there dated. Yeah, what it doesn't include though are the specialty reports. So like tonight's hate crime report is only linked in tonight's agenda packet. Um, so while it does include our regular monthly reports, it, it doesn't include like the Met report. Wouldn't You wouldn't be able to access that that way as well. So we, we might be able to come up with a solution to get catch both. Yeah, yeah and I have, I have seen that too. Um, on the previous agendas, the hyperlinks are gone. It would be really cool to have those hyperlinks as a permanent hyperlink. You go right to the, the exact attachment. Uh, Commissioner and, Williams, did you have an, uh, something you wanted to say? Uh, yeah, um, I do want to say it was an excellent meeting tonight. It really was. And um, Commissioner Holman, I haven't heard anything about a meeting tomorrow night, so I'm not sure whether or not um, our co-captain um, or myself or, <clears throat> excuse me, or Norton was aware of it. Uh, yes, Celia is aware of it. Okay, because I had spoken to her earlier, but she didn't say anything about it. Did oh, know? okay. Well, I'll connect with you. Um, outside of our meeting. Here. Okay, fine. And I just want to add, Vice Chair Berger, you did a fantastic job tonight of chairing the meeting. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Do we have any more commissioner comments? Can I would I, like to- Can I make a public comment yet? Did we? Oh, yes. Can we Can we have Wes Siegmiller? Is it okay that we- Yes, we can take comment? that out of order. Thank you, thank you, West, for coming, and thank you for your input, sending it to us too. So, and I want to also thank Kevin Burton. He's on here. I see his phone number, but West, yes, please, uh, and thanks for staying this whole time for us. Yeah, right. It's always a pleasure. Um, uh, well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad uh, you were able to look over the stuff I sent earlier today. <clears throat> I'm sorry I didn't give you more time to prepare, but um, I'm hope I'm hoping that kind of regular updates about the the homeless encampments, the sweeps uh, are, you know, like just more regular at this commission. Um, I just wanted to really briefly let everyone know on Friday, Outfest um, is starting and um, there's a movie called The Crystal Diaries, which is about um, the lives lost in West Hollywood, um, allegedly by Ed Buck. And um, my friend Jerome Kitchen is, you know, really, uh, puts his heart on the line and it's about, you know, the crisis of addiction in, in the community. So uh, you can get tickets at Outfest. That, it's called Crystal Diaries this Friday. Thank you, guys. Thank you, West. Any more commissioner comments? Okay, um, can we get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. So we have a motion by Commissioner Balboni and a second by Commissioner Williams. And the meeting will be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great night. Good night.